just snap your head. Who are you? I'm Ray. Ray who? Ray Skywalker. What? No! What? What? How can you do this? This is outrageous. It's unfair. It's ironic. My channel. Offering little to anyone who is not a diehard fan of the franchise already. So, looking back, I definitely could have worded that better. While I still believe that overall the prequels are poorly written, and I'll get to my reasoning in a moment, I think it's safe to say I went a little overboard in the brief section of my first video. My focus there was on the Star Wars sequel trilogy, and so I didn't put as much thought into my reassessment of the prequels as I have since. As a lot of commenters pointed out, Many people actually did become fans of Star Wars solely on account of the prequels, and my writing them off as having basically nothing of value was just plain wrong. When I rewatched the three movies for the most recent time, trying to go in with a fresh perspective and focusing solely on the writing, and not the acting, cinematography, effects, etc., I have to admit that there are a lot of elements that work. Whether or not that material comprises the majority of the trilogy is up for debate. I don't believe it does, but I still have to concede that the prequels do have a strong story outline even if the execution and details are often messy and muddled. I left a comment to this effect on my first video, which inspired some extensive discussion, but I'll run through the main points here in brief. The overarching plot of Palpatine manipulating the Senate to get himself elected Supreme Chancellor, using a crisis to gain emergency powers, and then transitioning the Republic into an authoritarian empire under his rule is a great basis for a story, and even with the movie's flaws it still offers a compelling look into the vulnerabilities inherent in a democratic system. And Anakin's fall to the dark side, while heavily rushed towards the end, could be truly great with a few relatively minor tweaks. Additionally, the prequels greatly expanded the Star Wars universe, giving us myriad new worlds, characters, and plot lines that sparked new life into an already immensely popular franchise. He's right. I know that many of the people who watch this are going to be big fans of the prequels as is, so I'd just like to respectfully ask that you go into this video with an open mind. Don't think of this video as erasing the prequels so much as rearranging the pieces that George Lucas already created into a different, and hopefully entertaining and coherent, story. Before we begin, I do want to note that while many of the problems I address may have been fixed or improved upon in other materials, such as the Clone Wars series, books, or comics, it is my belief that a movie should stand on its own. Supplemental material should enhance the moviegoing experience, not serve as a substitution or correction for it. Also, I'm going to be approaching my rewrites from the standpoint of being in Lucas's position in the 1990s, so for the sake of this video, let's assume that the various spin-off materials would have been written around my rewrites, and not the other way around. Essentially, the only Star Wars material I'll be considering as canon for the sake of this video is the original trilogy itself. Lastly, I want to thank everyone for their helpful feedback on my rewrite of the sequels. I know that it isn't possible to please everyone, and looking back, there are a lot of things in my rewrite that I myself would either change or greatly expand upon if I were making it now, but overall I am happy with the result, and I'm glad that so many other people were as well. My intention with that video, as it is with this one, was never to write a fully fleshed out script for three feature length movies, but to provide a rough outline that would, hypothetically, be further improved upon as it was sculpted into a finished script. Still, I got a lot of great feedback on what viewers felt worked and didn't work and on what they thought should have been delved into in more detail. Even the more critical comments were by and large very civil. And after all, critiquing each other is how we all get better, so keep those critiques coming. Now with that out of the way, let's run through some of my major criticisms of the existing prequels. Overall, I believe that The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones are two very poorly made movies, and Revenge of the Sith, while fun and enjoyable, is still of subpar quality. Even so, I must say that all three of these movies have much better writing than the sequels, and though Disney's films win on some of the technical aspects like acting, cinematography, quality of effects, and sound design, the prequels hardly lose out on every front. Sure, a lot of the effects have aged pretty poorly, and the incompetent dialogue was widely matched with stilted, awkward acting. I have brought peace, freedom, 
justice and security to my new empire. But a few people actually did a lot with the poor material they had to work with. And the music in the prequels is far better than the sequel's rehashing of old OT scores. The fights in the prequels, though often drawn out and over-choreographed, are typically far better than those of the sequels. There's also the iconic designs of the ships, clones, and droids, as well as numerous new characters that, while not always portrayed well or properly supported by the various aspects of the films, still gave us a lot more to work with than this. I bypassed the compressor. Not fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. Somehow Palpatine returned. Someone got paid to write those lines, by the way. With all that said, today I'm here to talk about one aspect alone, writing. So in this rewrite, I will assume that we could get a director who knows how to, well, direct actors, have a good mix of well-crafted practical effects and quality CGI, and avoid any of the other non-writing related problems that the existing prequel trilogy suffers from. The first of these major writing issues relates to Anakin's story. I know it's been said before, but we really don't need an entire movie with him as a kid. Relevant scenes from his childhood can always be flashed back to, and by starting the story with him as a teenager, we can make his prodigy status more believable and involve him more in the main plot lines earlier on, giving him and his relationships further development. And Anakin's fall to the dark side, while set up in many ways, is still heavily rushed in the end, much in the same manner as Daenerys' burning of King's Landing. While well, Danny kind of forgot him. Yeah, yeah, we know, she kind of forgot. <sighs> Anyways, Anakin is established as someone who is deeply devoted to the Jedi Order, even if he is annoyed at their refusal to promote him, and fearful of their discovery of his relationship with Padme. And though he is very close with Palpatine, who is basically a father figure to him, he's also best friends with Obi-Wan Kenobi, and the person he cares most about is Padme Amidala, a staunch supporter of democracy and the Jedi. And the Sith, who have been vanquished for thousands of years, are never really portrayed as potentially having been in the right. The most we get is Palpatine hinting that the Jedi and Sith aren't so different only days before Anakin's turn. It would have worked much better for Anakin himself to start questioning whether or not the Jedi were good long before his fall, possibly being influenced by dreams sent by Palpatine. But all we get is him fearing Padme's death, which in and of itself shouldn't be enough to turn him away from the order that he has devoted his life to, the order that rescued him from slavery and gave him power and a purpose. As a result, when Palpatine abruptly starts mentioning the Sith and implying that Anakin should look into their ways, it makes Anakin look stupid for not informing the Jedi Council, especially since when Palpatine admits that he is a Sith Lord, Anakin immediately reports him, showing that he does view the Sith as evil and is still loyal to the Jedi. And the most infamous part of Anakin's turn, slaughtering innocent children, makes no sense for the character we are shown. Anakin's interest in the dark side is purely about saving the woman he loves. But then, only moments after refusing to allow a Jedi to kill a Sith Lord because it's not the Jedi way, he has no qualms with murdering children. And then when Padme, the woman he did all of this for, rejects his evil actions, he immediately assaults her. Did he really not know the love of his life well enough to think that she wouldn't have a problem with this? It just makes Anakin look like a moron, or at best a hapless puppet with no true agency of his own. The story of Anakin's fall is in many ways the crux of the entire trilogy, and so it will be the main focus of my rewrites. As a relevant aside, I'm going to take a moment to discuss the concept of evil, and this may seem like a tangent, but please bear with me. To boil down an incredibly complex topic for the sake of this video, generally, evil actions are committed by three types of people. Those who believe that what they are doing is morally justified, those who don't believe in morality at all, and view it as a social construct used to hinder the weak or keep society in control, and those who simply lack a conception of morality altogether. Palpatine, our true villain for the trilogy as a whole, is of the second category, while Anakin, as a tragic character, should fall into the first. He should believe that what he is doing is right, even as he veers further and further from what we the audience understand to be the path of good. But the problem in his turn is that he veers too fast too suddenly right at the end with his murder of innocent children. His knee-jerk reaction of killing Mace Windu is far more believable. But after slaughtering the younglings, he then boasts to Obi-Wan about how he has brought peace and order to the galaxy, and how, from his point of view, the Jedi are evil. This shows that Anakin still clearly views himself as good, it's just that his conception of what exactly defines good has shifted. But it's shifted too far too fast. For those of you who would like further reading on this subject, I'd highly recommend the book Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland, which chronicles the actions of a group of German reserve police officers during the Holocaust. 
who went from ordinary middle-class citizens to perpetrators of genocide even as the majority of them had no particular desire to do so. Good or neutral people can be convinced to commit horribly evil actions, but this change in mindset takes time, and, to bring this back to the prequels, jumping from don't kill unarmed prisoners even if they're clearly evil to slaughtering innocent children is far too vast a chasm to believably bridge over the course of only a few minutes. Moving on, the second biggest problem with the trilogy is the basis of the Clone Wars. Now I actually love how Palpatine secretly controls both sides, manipulating the galaxy into a vulnerable state where people can be convinced to give him more power. But the problem is that in the prequels we never really get to see what drives the Separatists, and they're essentially presented as generic bad guys. After all, the galaxy is inhabited by trillions of sentient creatures, which means that both the Republic and Separatists must have a strong population base to draw from, and therefore each side must have very strong reasons for fighting for their respective causes. But instead, we just get a cabal of blatantly evil Sith and greedy bankers rolling from the shadows. In my rewrite, I will make the Separatist cause more sympathetic, and delve more into the details that set them on their path of rebellion, particularly with regards to the character of Count Dooku, who I think could naturally make for an extremely interesting secondary antagonist. Third is that the Senate of the Galactic Republic is never more than a rubber stamp. Palpatine just gives speeches and the Senate accepts whatever he says, no questions asked. And then suddenly, he just abolishes democracy and outlaws the Jedi, the guardians of the Republic for thousands of years, and the senators all cheer. I get what Lucas was going for about the dangers of centralized power, but even in interwar Germany, a country with a very short history of democracy, the Nazis weren't able to consolidate power immediately. They first used the excuse of emergency powers for the Chancellor, but even afterwards they allowed show elections and referenda to be held to provide the illusion of democracy, and only after several years did they outright abolish the old system. But the Galactic Republic, with tens of thousands of years of democratic history, is apparently fine with throwing all their liberties out the window overnight because Palpatine said so? It seems to me that Lucas did this because he wanted us to see the Empire's official beginning, but we don't need this. It would be much better and more believable to end with Palpatine giving a speech about how he will be retaining emergency powers for the foreseeable future during these unstable times. This way, we can infer a more gradual transition from Republic to Empire, with the final moment coming at the beginning of A New Hope, when Palpatine finally dissolves the Galactic Senate. Fourth, the existing prequel trilogy suffers from its structure, particularly with regards to the large time jump between episodes 1 and 2. This skips over an important part of Anakin's journey, and rushes the development of the relationship between him and Obi-Wan in the second movie after they spent very little time interacting in the first. By reworking the plot of Episode 1 to take place when Anakin is older, this will give us more time to develop his ultimately doomed friendship with Obi-Wan earlier on, which in turn will leave us with more time to explore Anakin's descent. Fifth is the basis for the plot in The Phantom Menace. The central conflict of the movie involves the Trade Federation blockading, and then invading, the planet of Naboo. And this is confusing, in several ways. The Trade Federation is a corporation, or perhaps an interplanetary organization, akin to OPEC or the EEC, and yet they have representation in the Senate, and Naboo, which is also in the Senate, gets blockaded by them, and the Senate doesn't take action to defend them? Now this isn't terrible writing, because you can infer some of the details here, but it would be much, much better if things were clarified just a little. All you'd need is a few lines and a few scenes for this to all make perfect sense. But as it stands, this seems akin to the Exxon Corporation blockading the state of Florida and the US Congress just doing nothing. In my rewrite, the Trade Federation is an economic bloc within the Galactic Republic. Their headquarters is on Cato Nemoidia, so the Nemoidians have a lot of power within this group, but it's essentially a free trade zone or agreement within the Republic, and Naboo is a part of it. This will allow everything to make more sense. The Trade Federation doesn't have direct representation in the Senate, but all of its members have individual representation there, making up a powerful voting bloc. The central conflict will be that Naboo wants to leave. Perhaps the Trade Federation is getting too overbearing, similar to the situation with Britain and the EU in real life, and so Naboo wants to withdraw. And maybe we hint that Palpatine was the one who was originally behind the withdrawal, setting in motion this whole chain of events and giving us even more insight into his political acumen. Naboo wants to leave, but still owes dues to the Trade Federation, or has some other obligation they aren't fulfilling, and so that is why the Trade Federation blockades them, and that is why the Galactic Republic refuses to intervene and dithers for so long. In a way, it's an internal dispute, and it helps if Naboo is not entirely in the right, at least from a legal standpoint. We could establish all of this with only a few lines, and it would help to greatly clarify the situation. Sixth is the military situation of the galaxy in The Phantom Menace. 
I have no problem with the Trade Federation having a private army. Those exist even in real life. But unfortunately, the state of the Republic's military is never made clear. Again, not awful writing, since inferences can be made, but definitely subpar writing. In my version, we will make it clear that the Galactic Republic functions similarly to how the EU or UN work. Once a decision on military action is agreed to, member states will contribute to a common peacekeeping force. Later on in this movie, we can have Queen Amidala speak with Bail Organa, which establishes both him and his home planet of Alderaan earlier, making the audience more invested when they're destroyed in A New Hope. And Bail can reference how Alderaan is ready to contribute forces to a peacekeeping mission once the Republic approves it. This will also add more context for one of the central points in the second movie, where the Senate is debating the creation of an army of the Republic, similarly to how there have been debates within the EU and UN over having military forces directly under control of the central leadership. Seventh is the setup for Qui-Gon finding Anakin in the first place, and being stuck on Tatooine. When the group leaves Naboo, they easily make it through an inexplicably diminished Trade Federation blockade, then presumably jump to hyperspace, only to arrive near the planet Tatooine, which is located beyond the boundaries of the Republic. I suppose this could be attributed to damage to the hyperspace drive, but it isn't explained very well. And then, when the group lands on Tatooine, they are unable to purchase the parts necessary to repair the ship because no one here uses Republic credits. What? I get that this planet is beyond the boundaries of the Republic, which is why slavery is still legal here, but you're telling me that no one even exchanges currency for the most powerful organization in the galaxy? It would make sense for there to be steep fees associated with currency conversion, but saying that no one engages in this kind of business here makes about as much sense as saying that no one would be interested in purchasing water. And since this contrivance forces Qui-Gon to bet on Anakin in the pod race, dragging the rest of the group along and keeping them stuck on Tatooine for a significant chunk of the movie, it plays a major role in the plot, and as such will be subject to major revisions. Eighth is the events surrounding the formation of the clone army on Kamino in Attack of the Clones. This whole plotline is far too convoluted. Supposedly, a Jedi Master went to Kamino and commissioned an army of nearly two million clones on his own, and for the last ten years the Kaminoans haven't even been in contact with the Republic? So can anyone connected with the Republic government just order a massive army? And the Kaminoans have the capability to make not only the clones, but the ships and weapons and armor for this army as well? If that's the case, why aren't they a military powerhouse in their own right? And how is it that the Separatists under Count Dooku have become involved in the clones' development, even though the army is being made for the Republic? All of this may be explained in spin-off material, but the problem is that it makes very little sense in the actual movie, and the reason for this is very metatextual. George Lucas wanted audiences to question whether or not the clones were the good guys before their surprise arrival in the third act. After all, they intentionally resemble stormtroopers, and before Attack of the Clones released, the details of the Clone Wars were kept under lock and key by Lucas himself. I get the idea of wanting all of this to be shrouded in mystery, but the problem, again, is that this storyline is far too convoluted as a result. In my rewrites, I will be greatly simplifying this subplot, leaving us more time to explore both the relationships between Anakin and Obi-Wan, and between Anakin and Padme. The clones will have already been publicly ordered from Kamino, with the weapons, armor, and ships made elsewhere, and by the start of Episode 2, this army will be on the verge of being completed, with the issue of how and where to deploy them, and whose control they will be under, being hotly debated. The ninth major problem deals with the Jedi Council, and their involvement in the leadership of the Republic, in particular their relationship with the Galactic Senate. Palpatine's ultimate goal is the downfall of the Jedi, and part of the story is that the Jedi have become corrupted or complacent in their lofty position, but we rarely actually see this playing out in the existing trilogy. It would be much better if we see relations between the Jedi Council and the Senate gradually deteriorating over the course of the three movies, with subtle hints that Palpatine is covertly exacerbating the tensions while facetiously trying to mend their relationship. Perhaps the Jedi could even start trying to usurp the Senate's authority when they learn that a Sith Lord has influence over hundreds of senators, leading to a sort of well-intentioned witch hunt that ultimately alienates many of their former allies in the Senate. This way, when Palpatine announces to the Senate that the Jedi have tried to lead a coup to seize control of the Republic, we will have a better understanding of why so many senators are so receptive to this idea, and are on board with abolishing the Jedi. And finally, the tenth problem regards the nature of the Jedi prophecy. I will admit that this may be due to a lack of understanding on my part, but as far as I can tell, to this day there is still widespread disagreement on and discussion over what exactly the prophecy of bringing balance to the Force means. The most common interpretations are that it means either reducing both the Jedi and Sith to two members each, or that the Force is only balanced when all Sith are removed, meaning that they are the imbalance, which Anakin technically does bring about through his son Luke, and through killing Palpatine at the end of Return of the Jedi. 
George Lucas himself appears to favor the latter interpretation, which makes sense in that the Jedi would not want equal numbers of themselves in Sith, but this raises the question of why the Jedi at the start of The Phantom Menace were so concerned about the prophecy at all. The Sith had supposedly been extinct for thousands of years, and the Jedi were at the height of their power, so by that logic wouldn't the Force already be balanced? I understand the idea that they were misinterpreting the prophecy, but their heavy focus on it doesn't seem to make sense, especially within the confines of just the movies. As I mentioned earlier, this may be explained better in spin-off material, but as far as I can tell it isn't properly conveyed to the audience in the trilogy itself. By removing the angle of Anakin being a supposed chosen one, this will subsequently make the Jedi Council's lack of close care and concern for him make more sense. After all, in the existing trilogy, it's very strange that even when Anakin is so clearly troubled, Yoda and the others make little effort to provide counsel to him. But if instead of being the chosen one, Anakin is just one promising pupil among many, it would better explain their lack of involvement. And so now, it's time to dive into the rewrites themselves. We open with a shot of a Republic vessel moving through space, coming into orbit over the verdant planet of Naboo. We soon cut to the interior, where the crew is preparing to land in the capital of Theed. An officer enters a room where two robed figures sit, and informs them that they will be reaching their destination shortly. As Obi-Wan Kenobi, the younger of the pair, muses on how the Chancellor has confidence in their ability to resolve the dispute peacefully, we see his master Qui-Gon Jinn pensively gazing out the window. He tells his apprentice, I'm not so sure the galaxy is as simple as the Chancellor wishes it was. Maybe we can even work in a I've got a bad feeling about this somewhere. Right off the bat, we can establish the dynamic between the two. Qui-Gon, the master, is the unorthodox gung-ho cowboy type, while Obi-Wan, the pupil, is much more by the books, a sort of inversion of the common trope. We then cut to a conference room of Trade Federation officials on the planet, among them Newt Gunray, the Viceroy of the Federation. He enters a room alone, where a hologram comes to life. An ominous hooded figure informs him that the negotiators are nearly there, and asks if his preparations are complete. Yes, Gunray tells him, but I am loath to waste resources like this. Are you sure there is no better way? Sidious ensures him that it is no waste. As your people know better than anyone, he tells the Nemoidian, sacrifice is necessary for gain, and do not fear. My apprentice, Darth Maul, will be close at hand. He drops the connection, and we return to the Republic vessel. The ship descends to the planet's surface, and the Jedi disembark to be greeted by a delegation of the Naboo. They lead the pair inside and direct them to a meeting room, where two low-level Trade Federation bureaucrats sit opposite them. Obi-Wan seems calm and relaxed, while Qui-Gon lets a hint of tension pass across his face, as if he senses something is amiss. Let us begin, one of the Naboo negotiators says, while we cut to a shot beneath the table, where a tiny device blinks. The camera then cuts to the hangar, where another device begins blinking on a clamp beside the Republic vessel. We can start with the dues your planet owes the Federation, one of the Nemoidians says. You have no right to renege on your obligations to us. The Naboo answer back defiantly, and the room soon devolves into shouting, as we cut back to the device blinking beneath the table, then to Qui-Gon's face sinking from concern to fear. He leaps up, yells for Obi-Wan, and Force pushes the two of them away from the room and out into the hall just as a series of explosions rip through the Trade Federation offices. Alarms begin to go off, and personnel scramble through the corridors as the two Jedi awaken in the rubble. The negotiators for both sides have been killed, and the Trade Federation offices are in chaos. 
outside, people run for cover, as droids and Naboo security begin exchanging sporadic fire in the confusion. And though we, the audience, know that Newt Gunray is responsible, the characters don't have proof, which serves to both give the Trade Federation plausible deniability, as they lost people, equipment, and infrastructure in the bombing, and to convey to the audience the ruthless, cowardly nature of Newt Gunray, who is quite willing to sacrifice his own underlings to achieve his goals. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan encounter battle droids who open fire on them, and the two Jedi cut through the first wave, only to be forced back by destroyer droids. During this action scene, we can get an idea of the capabilities of the Jedi as they navigate the partially ruined structure. Obi-Wan urges his master to leave so that they can learn what happened, but Qui-Gon is convinced that Newt Gunray is behind this, and fights on towards the command center. They begin cutting through the blast doors, and a panicked Viceroy contacts Sidious, who ensures him that, My apprentice is observing the events closely. He will watch over you. More destroyer droids arrive, forcing Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan back, and eventually they flee the structure and emerge onto the city streets. As they do so, we see a number of Trade Federation vessels descending over the city, as sirens blare and droid voices announce that the Trade Federation is moving in to secure the city. As the Jedi evade the bolstered patrols of droids, they watch as civilians cower and hide while the outnumbered Naboo security forces are rapidly overwhelmed. The ruler of Naboo, the young queen Padme Amidala, is soon captured, and in a broadcast from the palace, clearly under duress, orders all of her forces to stand down. Nemoidian officials, standing by her side, assure the populace, the perpetrators of this horrific act will be brought to justice. Qui-Gon looks to Obi-Wan, then begins heading for the palace, leaving his young people to ask, Master? When Qui-Gon doesn't look back, he shrugs, mutters, I guess we're doing this, and hurries after him. The two Jedi stealthily infiltrate the palace, making their way to where the queen is being held. They release her and a number of other prisoners, including Captain Panaka, her chief of security, and the group quickly arm themselves. Amidala informs the Jedi that she has a hangar full of ships waiting for takeoff, and we cut to a number of astromech droids preparing a shuttle. Among them, R2-D2. When the Trade Federation realize that she is missing, droids swarm the area, and the group fights their way out. Just as they make it to the hangar, Qui-Gon spots a mysterious figure clothed in black robes and pushes him back with the Force, only to have the newcomer resist him. The group boards the main ship as several pilots enter smaller starfighters, and the squadron races into the skies, heading for a weak point in the blockade. They set a course for Coruscant, with Amidala desperate to inform the Senate about what is happening on her planet. Droid ships open fire on them, and a brief dogfight ensues, but the other pilots buy time for Amidala to run the blockade, only for a blast to strike the ship just as it jumps into hyperspace. All of the astromech droids on board are deployed to repair the damage, but only one, R2-D2, manages to avoid destruction. On the bridge, Captain Panaka informs them that the shot knocked out their comms and damaged the hyperspace engine, which means that they may not be able to stay in hyperspace for long, and may already be off course. Warning sirens then go off, and the ship drops out of hyperspace in orbit around Tatooine, known as a lawless and harsh desert planet on the fringes of Republic space. As they descend, Qui-Gon warns Amidala that they need to be careful here, as the Huts who rule the region would likely sell her out to the Trade Federation if her identity were discovered. Amidala agrees, and the ship makes a forced landing in a rural area, with only a single farmstead showing up on the short-range scanners. After the dust settles and the group is able to examine the ship, one of the crew members declares that they will need several parts to get the hyperdrive and comms array operational. Captain Panaka suggests going to the nearest city to call for help, but the Queen heeds Qui-Gon's warnings about the dangers of doing so. As the party discusses their next moves, a voice calls out from the darkness, and a teenaged local hops down from the rocky cliffs above. He introduces himself as Anakin Skywalker, and while we see him share a lingering look with the Queen, Qui-Gon seems to sense something unique about the boy. Anakin tells the others that he and his family live nearby, just himself, his mother, and his aunt and uncle on their farmstead. People rarely come looking out here, he says, so you should be safe. That is, if you don't want to be found. Obi-Wan mentions to Qui-Gon that he doesn't trust the boy, but Qui-Gon quickly warms to him and accepts his invitation. The two Jedi, Padme and Panaka, set out, accompanying Anakin back to his home. Arriving at the Lars homestead, Anakin introduces the four to his family. His mother, Shmi, her brother Owen Lars, and Owen's wife, Baru. The family are moisture farmers, 
living a moderately comfortable existence, though as Anakin helps his family prepare a meal for their guests, we get hints that he yearns for something beyond his present station. Panaka returns to the ship to bring the rest of the crew back to the homestead, and Qui-Gon converses with Anakin and his family. Lars asks what business has brought them out so far, when they clearly aren't from around here. Qui-Gon and Padme both remain non-committal. Well, you're a Jedi, aren't you? Anakin asks. Obi-Wan and his master exchange a look, but Anakin presses him. Oh, come on, I noticed your lightsaber. Qui-Gon studies him sternly for a moment, then cracks a grin and produces his lightsaber. Suppose I killed a Jedi and stole his weapon? Not possible, Anakin says with a chuckle. No one can kill a Jedi. So what brings you out here? Hunting the enemies of the Republic? Searching for lost artifacts? Merely passing through, Obi-Wan cuts in defensively. And we can't linger long, I'm afraid. Anakin looks at him, and his grin fades. Yeah, nobody does, not around this place. Except us, of course. Then he perks up again. So you must have seen all kinds of things in your travels, been to all kinds of planets. Here, Qui-Gon relates a quick anecdote about one of his previous adventures, while Anakin listens, enwrapped. That must be great, to live like that, he says when Qui-Gon is done. Getting to see the galaxy. I've seen enough of this place to fill ten lifetimes already. It's a good, honest life, Anakin, his mother cuts in. The world out there is a dangerous place. That's what makes it interesting, he shoots back. Here, Qui-Gon steps in. Have you ever noticed anything unique about your son? He asks Shmi. Of course, she says. He's bright, full of fire, just like his father was. Qui-Gon looks to Anakin, who shies away. He's also one of the best pilots on the planet, Owen says, bringing in food alongside his wife. You should have seen him in the pod races last month. He nearly beat the reigning champion. Well, if Saboba and his goons hadn't tinkered with the engine, Anakin replies, I would have won. It's all rigged. I nearly went up in flames, and yet nobody batted an eye. As it stands, I barely made enough to pay Watto back what I owed him. Still, Owen says, you're a whole lot better than I was at your age. Give it a few more years and they'll stand no chance against you, even if they cheat. So you're a good pilot, Qui-Gon asks. Anakin shrugs, a smile playing across his lips. I just... I don't know. I get a feeling when I'm flying. A sense of where to go, how to move. It's hard to explain. He looks away, and Qui-Gon peers at him more intently, then looks to his mother. You should take a look at their ship, Anakin, Owen tells him. The boy's good with machines. Fixed up an old protocol droid I bought for scrap money a while back. Show him, son. At this, Anakin leaves, and comes back with a skeletal C-3PO, who introduces himself to the group. Padme watches Anakin closely, and as the others continue the conversation, we see the two of them shooting looks back and forth. Well, we'll let you folks get some rest for now, Owen tells the group. Tomorrow, Anakin and I can come out and take a look at your ship, see what we can do. Padme thanks them, assuring the family that they have the credits to pay for their services as well as for any parts that may be needed. We then cut to a shot of the landscape, with the last of the daylight fading, before jumping to a darkened corridor somewhere on Coruscant. The black-robed figure we saw earlier walks alongside a holographic projection of the sinister and enigmatic Lord Sidious, who addresses his apprentice. We have tracked them to Tatooine, Sidious tells him. The queen is to be taken alive. She may prove most valuable to us but the Jedi are yours to dispose of. The figure looks at him, removing his hood, revealing his spiked red and black face. Long have my people waited for justice to be done to the Jedi. They will not leave the planet alive. Let your hatred fuel you, my apprentice, Sidious says, but do not underestimate them. For far too long have the Jedi ruled from on high while our people skulked about in the shadows, the stranger replies. They have grown weak, complacent, while our suffering has steeled us. I will not fail you, master. Good, Maul, Sidious says. Now go and show them the power of the Sith. Cut back to Tatooine, where the binary suns rise over the desert. Anakin and his uncle then set out with the Jedi, Padme, and Panaka, and they spend some time inspecting the damaged ship. As they do so, Obi-Wan and Anakin squabble mildly, with Qui-Gon intervening. While they work, Anakin continues to express envy about their being free to travel anywhere to Padme. I'm sure with your talents you'll find a way out of here one day, she assures him. 
At this, a worried look flashes across Anakin's face. I don't know, he mutters, glancing back at the homestead. My mother is happy here, but as much as I'd like to, it seems wrong to leave her. What if something happens, you know? Padme rests a hand on his shoulder, and the two share a look before returning to work. After identifying the problems, Anakin states that they will need several parts. I know where we can get them, he tells the others, as long as you have the credits. I can come with you, Padme says, but Captain Panaka urges her not to, insisting that it's too dangerous. My Padawan can help you, Qui-Gon tells Anakin. An irritated look crosses Obi-Wan's face, and he makes to protest but holds his tongue. It'll be good experience for him. After all, a true Jedi must be prepared for anything. You can take our speeder, Owen says, but be careful, especially when dealing with them. Anakin dismisses his concerns, then looks over at Obi-Wan, who watches him skeptically. Cut to the two racing across the sand in the speeder, with Anakin driving, swerving around obstacles as Obi-Wan clings to the vehicle. I thought you said you were a good pilot, he shouts. Anakin just smirks at him. The best! He swerves again, then cheers as they race on. Eventually, the speeder slows, and something looms in the desert before them. As they near, we see a towering sand crawler come into view, with numerous Jawas bartering with other locals in its shadow. Among the customers are a group of Tusken raiders, and Anakin glares at them briefly. Just let me do the talking, he tells Obi-Wan. Cut back to the homestead, where Qui-Gon is meditating. He sees a vision of a figure clad in black who ignites a red lightsaber, and then Anakin, shouting for someone in the darkness. He opens his eyes as Shmi enters the room. You wanted to speak with me? She asks. Yes, Qui-Gon tells her. It's about your son. Are you familiar with the Force? Not much, she replies. It's a power the Jedi use, right? He smiles. It's much more than that. The Force is everywhere, permeating everything. We are all a part of it, but some of us may learn to control it to an extent. Jedi are one such group. Now, this may surprise you, but I believe that your son is... Well, I can practically see the Force around him. I've never seen it so strong in one so young, and without training. Shmi looks surprised. You can... you can just sense that? She asks. Yes, I am a Jedi Master, and I would never have attained my rank if I couldn't. This may sound strange, but I believe that it was the will of the Force that brought us here, to your son. And with your permission, I would like to bring him with me, to train as a Jedi. With proper training, your son could very well change the galaxy. Shmi stares at the Jedi Master with a contemplative expression, but we cut away before she gives a response. Back with the Jawas, Anakin barters for the parts they need, and he and Obi-Wan begin loading them into the speeder. Just as they are finishing, Anakin looks up and inhales deeply. Cut to a group of thugs approaching the makeshift market on speeders, brandishing an assortment of weapons. Who are they? Obi-Wan asks. Uh, no one, Anakin says. Well, let's go. Skywalker! One of them shouts, raising a blaster. As the pair hurry back to their own speeder, Anakin says, Remember what I said about Sebulba? Well, I might have arranged for a little payback. What kind of payback? Uh, the kind where his engine fries itself upon ignition? Anakin responds with a shrug. The thugs navigate through the crowd, and one of them takes a shot at Anakin, but Obi-Wan ignites his lightsaber and deftly deflects it. As the two race off, the thugs give chase on their own speeders, and Obi-Wan looks back nervously. Don't worry, they'll never chase us onto my uncle's land, Anakin says. They wouldn't dare. Are you sure we'll make it there? Obi-Wan asks. Anakin just swerves, and gives a grim smile. The two are then pursued through rocky terrain, with Anakin dodging obstacles as Obi-Wan deflects blaster shots. You said these guys tried to kill you, right? Their boss did, Anakin tells him. Obi-Wan eyes him for a moment, then deflects the next shot so it strikes one of the speeders, which goes up in flames. The other pursuers then fan out in advance, swerving to try and destabilize their craft. Here, take control, Anakin shouts. Obi-Wan manages to grab the controls as Anakin reaches for a compartment and retrieves a blaster, taking several shots but missing. Keep it steady! I'm trying! Anakin fires again, nailing one of the thugs. There! Obi-Wan glances back and shakes his head, muttering, so uncivilized. 
As they continue, Anakin succeeds in taking out the rest of their pursuers as Obi-Wan struggles to evade their obstacles, damaging the speeder but managing to make it back to open ground. Obi-Wan apologizes for the damage, assuring him that they can pay for it. I figured, Anakin says with a grin. The two arrive back at the Lars homestead late in the day, and decide not to mention what happened to the others, though we can see from the look between Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon that his master certainly suspects something. As everyone gathers around for dinner, Shmi tells her son that she has good news. Anakin, this man, she says, gesturing to Qui-Gon, would like to train you to be a Jedi. Anakin looks shocked, but this soon gives way to excitement. Really? Qui-Gon simply smiles back at him. And you're all right with this, mother? You're nearly a grown man now, Anakin. You can't stay here forever. But, he steps closer to his mother, you'll be all right without me? I still have the others, Anakin, she tells him. And this is my home, where I belong. I'm content here. But you, you belong out there, helping people. It's what your father would have wanted. She takes a necklace and presses it into his palm. Never forget where you came from, Anakin, she tells him, her eyes growing misty. But don't let it hold you back. We will be leaving the morning after next, Qui-Gon announces, assuming our repairs are completed. If you would like to come with us, be ready to depart by then. Anakin gladly accepts his offer, and the group settles down to continue their meal. Now we cut to the skies, where a new ship descends to the surface. The ramp lowers, and Darth Maul emerges, accompanied by several probe droids. He dispatches them, and they spread out across the desert. Come morning, the group sets about repairing the ship, but while working, Qui-Gon senses that something is amiss, almost as if they are being watched. He notices Anakin glancing uneasily at the dunes around them too, and asks if something is wrong. I'm not sure, Anakin replies. It's just a feeling. Like, like we're being watched, Obi-Wan says, joining them. The three scan their surroundings once more, but spot nothing. Make sure everyone is ready to depart as soon as the repairs are completed, Qui-Gon announces. Our hosts have been quite generous, and I would hate to repay their hospitality by bringing down trouble upon them. That night, as repairs on the ship are nearly completed, Obi-Wan sits staring out at the stars when he notices someone approaching through the darkness. He reaches for his lightsaber, only to see Anakin walking up to join him. Sorry, I couldn't sleep, Anakin says. Obi-Wan looks at him for a moment, then scoots over to make room. Anakin sits down beside him. You have an important decision ahead of you, Obi-Wan tells him. I've already made my decision, Anakin responds. Obi-Wan looks more closely at him. Becoming a Jedi is no light undertaking, Anakin. It is an all-encompassing commitment, a promise to devote one's life to the Order. He turns away, a hint of annoyance, or perhaps resentment, tinging his voice. Anakin watches him for a bit, then asks, What was it like? When you left your home, I mean. Obi-Wan turns back to face him. To tell you the truth, I don't much remember it. I was much younger than you are now. Typically, Force-sensitive individuals are identified at half your age, and, permitted their parents are willing, they are brought back to the Jedi Temple to be raised in the Order. We aren't supposed to have any attachments outside the Order, you see? It could conflict with our duties to preserving the Republic. So, you don't miss your parents? Anakin asks. You don't ever find yourself thinking about them? Where they might be? What they might think of all this? If they ever wonder about you? Obi-Wan sighs. No, not really. The Jedi are my family, my entire world. And if you want to become one of us, you must be willing to let all of this go. He gestures towards the darkened farmstead, but when he sees Anakin's expression sour, Obi-Wan places a hand on his shoulder. If what Qui-Gon says is true, if it truly was the will of the Force that brought us to you, then I am sure you will be fine. Anakin nods to him, and together the two stare out into the stars above in silence. The next morning, Captain Panaka informs Padme that the ship is now ready for liftoff. As the crew shuffle aboard, we cut to Anakin back at the homestead, bidding his family farewell. As he and his mother embrace, he clutches the necklace she gave him and promises to always remember her, no matter what happens. He then leaves and heads for the ship alongside Obi-Wan. As they traverse the sandy path, we cut to a shot from a distant hilltop, where a black-robed figure steps in front of the camera. Cut back to Obi-Wan, who freezes. He looks to Anakin, who stares back at him tensely. 
Obi-Wan then draws his saber as a speeder rushes down past the two, and its black-clad rider leaps off, igniting a red lightsaber. Anakin fires a blaster at the figure, who tosses him aside with the Force before rushing Obi-Wan. The Padawan is forced back over and over, struggling to maintain a grip on his lightsaber, when suddenly Qui-Gon jumps into the fray, telling the others to run for the ship. Obi-Wan hesitates for a moment before hurrying away, as Qui-Gon stares down their mysterious attacker. His gaze goes to the red saber, then to Maul's face, and he breathes out deeply. Maul glares at him, hatred simmering behind his eyes. We hear the ship start up, and slowly begin lumbering towards them. Maul strikes at Qui-Gon, who fights defensively, as up in the ship Anakin and Obi-Wan work to lower a rope down towards the Jedi Master. Qui-Gon and Maul continue to trade blows, until, seeing an opening, the former pushes his attacker back with the Force, then jumps up and grips the rope. Obi-Wan and Anakin haul Qui-Gon up, and as Maul recovers, he watches the ship ascend into the sky, rage flashing across his face, before rushing to his own ship to give pursuit. The Naboo ship exits the atmosphere and jumps to hyperspace as the trio enter the main deck, still shaken. Who was that? Anakin asks. Obi-Wan and his master share a knowing look, but remain silent. Arriving in orbit over Coruscant, the capital of the Republic, the ship descends to the surface and lands outside the Senate building. Here, they are greeted by a retinue of officials, including Supreme Chancellor Valorum, the embattled head of state of the Republic. Valorum assures Padme that she will have a chance to testify before the Senate, while her fellow Naboo, Senator Palpatine, states that he will stand by her side. If we are to have any hopes of preserving our way of life, he tells Amidala, we must be willing to stand against the corruption that has taken root in our system. He and the Chancellor exchange less than amicable glances, and Valorum takes Padme aside. He explains to her that his grip on power is much more tenuous than it may appear, and that, Despite sympathizing with the plight of her planet, he is loath to upset millennia of democratic precedent by exerting too much authority. Sometimes, Padme tells him in response, being afraid to exert authority is precisely what allows a democracy to crumble. As the troubled Chancellor leaves, and Senator Palpatine escorts the others inside, he silently takes note of Anakin, hinting at his true nature. Qui-Gon returns to the Jedi Temple, where he speaks with Yoda, the Grand Master of the Order. After first discussing their encounters with what seems to be a Sith, who have supposedly been extinct for thousands of years, Qui-Gon summons Anakin before him. Yoda looks him over briefly before motioning for him to wait outside. I believe it is the will of the Force that brought him to me, Qui-Gon says. I have never sensed one so strong who lacked any kind of training. Strong, yes, Yoda replies, but troubled, filled with ambition and attachment. I know he is far older than those we typically take under our wing, Qui-Gon admits, but he has great potential. Give me the chance to train him, and I assure you he will attain heights few of our order ever dream of. Yoda furrows his brows and breathes out deeply. He promises that Anakin will be brought before the council, and Qui-Gon graciously accepts. As he leaves, Yoda watches him go with a troubled expression. Cut to a darkened corridor, where Maul hesitantly approaches the cloaked figure of Lord Sidious. You allowed the Jedi to escape, he tells his apprentice, anger seeping into his voice. They fled from me, Maul responds. The Jedi did not dare engage. They will not escape me again. Another chance may come soon, Sidious says. Should it arise, I trust you will not let it go to waste. Maul bows, then rises slowly. As he turns to stride from the room, we see his eyes narrow in anger, and the camera cuts as he walks towards it. Padme sits in a chamber in the Senate building, reviewing the Trade Federation-approved transmissions that are being dispatched from Naboo. The Federation has rounded up many influential figures from the planet's government and is preparing to bring them to Cato Nemoidia, capital of the Federation, quote, until the current crisis settles down and peace and security are restored to Naboo, end quote. The door opens, and she looks up. Master Qui-Gon, she says. He enters, with an older man following behind him. This is Count Dooku, he tells her. One of the most powerful of our order, and a good friend. Dooku greets her, and Padme turns her attention back to the transmissions. If we allow them to take our people to Cato Nemoidia, she says, the Trade Federation will be able to use them as hostages. 
we will likely never see them again. It won't come to that, Qui-Gon assures her. The Senate will see the truth when you go before them. Will they? Padme asks. Senator Palpatine has much more experience in this field than I do, and yet he has no great deal of confidence in them. And though I consider Chancellor Valorum an ally, a friend to my people, he lacks the will to stand against our foes. I... I must admit I have very little faith in the system as of now. It is a shame, Count Dooku says. As Jedi, we have the power to right the wrongs of the galaxy, and yet we allow ourselves to be tethered to the bureaucratic ineptitudes of this decrepit body. In locking ourselves away in our towers, we fail the powerless people our order purports to help. We should be out there in the thick of things, using our abilities for the good of the galaxy. Qui-Gon nods, then turns back to Padme. Rest assured, your highness, you will not have to testify alone. However great the failings of the Senate may be, surely the word of a Jedi Master still carries weight. Padme returns his smile, and the two Jedi leave. As they do, Qui-Gon brings up the subject of Anakin. Yes, Dooku replies. This potential pupil of yours... You already have one Padawan, do you not? It is not unheard of for a master to take on more than one, Qui-Gon tells him, and Obi-Wan is nearly ready to be made a knight himself. But this boy... Dooku, you must understand when I tell you that the will of the Force brought him to us. I know some of the others have been... less than accepting of my unorthodox tendencies, but you have always seemed to understand. With proper training, this boy could become a great Jedi, perhaps even the greatest. Dooku looks at him intently, then continues walking. I will be sure to keep this in mind, he says, when the boy comes before the council. Cut to a shot of the city at night, and then to Anakin, who is trying to sleep. As he stares at the ceiling, his gaze growing more and more focused, we see his hand closing tighter around the necklace his mother gave him. The sounds of the world fade away, and we hear an echoey, disembodied scream. His eyes grow worried, and he begins to breathe deeper as the sounds of conflict seep into his awareness. Something moves nearby, and he launches upright, only to see Padme walking past him. Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you, she tells him. It's all right, he responds. I don't think I'll be getting much sleep. Not tonight, at least. Me neither, she says. The two walk to a balcony, looking out over the nighttime cityscape. You're going before the Senate tomorrow, right? Anakin asks. Padme sighs. Yes, but I'm worried. The forces my planet is up against. They have a stranglehold in the Senate. I'm not sure what hope there is. Once they hear you speak, Anakin tells her with a smile, I'm sure they'll see things your way. She smiles back at him, and he continues. If I had half of your charm, I'd have no trouble convincing the Jedi to accept me. I go before the Council tomorrow, he explains. Once they see you, Padme tells him, I'm sure they'll have no chance but to take you on. Silence settles over the scene, and the pair look out over the darkened cityscape together as the camera pans up. The next morning, Anakin and Obi-Wan are busy preparing for the latter's hearing before the council. Padme and Qui-Gon arrive, and each pair wishes the other luck in their respective endeavors. I wish I could be there to speak on your behalf, Qui-Gon says, but I must go before the Senate alongside Queen Amidala. I have already spoken with Masters Yoda and Dooku, and I have faith in you, my young Padawan, he adds, turning to Obi-Wan. They then go their separate ways, with Padme and Qui-Gon entering the vast Senate chamber, where they are greeted by Palpatine and another senator, Bail Organa of Alderaan. Our people are counting on you, your highness, Palpatine tells her. Whatever you do, you must make the Senate believe. My own planet is ready to contribute to a Republic peacekeeping mission, Bale adds, There are many here who fear the power of the Trade Federation, or other groups like it. All we need is for you to convince them. As the proceedings begin, we cut back to Obi-Wan and Anakin coming before the Jedi Council, the Masters watching them as the two stand in their midst. Yoda, Count Dooku, Mace Windu, Ki Adi Mundi, Shakti, and others watch as Anakin steps forth. Cut back to Padme, whose platform hovers into the air as she begins to speak. My fellow senators, I come before you today to plead for your help. My people have long suffered under the unjust terms of our association with the Trade Federation, and now we wish to forge our own path, 
and in return we have been illegally blockaded and occupied. The Nemoidian delegation protests loudly, as do several others, but Chancellor Valorum quiets them. Padme continues, Unless we wish to see the values this body claims to uphold trampled and eroded, unless each of you wishes to leave yourselves vulnerable tomorrow to the same injustices my people suffer today, I implore you to take action, assemble a peacekeeping force, and liberate Naboo from this illegal occupation. This is outrageous, a Nemoidian senator protests. Naboo terrorists struck our installations during the middle of our negotiations, and Queen Abadallah's government still owes obligations to the Federation. Until the situation calms down, and their debts are repaid, our forces must remain in place. Cut back to Obi-Wan and Anakin before the Council. The former speaks of their discovery of Anakin, of Qui-Gon's faith in him that the will of the Force brought Anakin to them, and then turns their discussion to the Sith. As my master has already informed you, he says, we encountered what we believe to be a Sith on Naboo, and this person tracked us to Tatooine. If the Sith truly have returned, we are going to need strong Jedi now more than ever. At this, Mace Windu interjects. A Jedi is not defined by strength alone, young Padawan. You of all people know that well. What matters is the ability to control that strength. And I do not sense that within Skywalker. Anakin stands still, his eyes narrowing slightly. Why do you want to become a Jedi? Windu asks him. Why? Anakin asks back. Why not? The Jedi are great warriors, guardians of peace and justice throughout the galaxy. If I have power, why not use that to help people? Ambition and attachment hang over the boy like clouds, Shakti observes. I could sense it as soon as he entered the room. Obi-Wan glances back at Anakin as Yoda leans forward. Do you have family, young Skywalker? Yoda asks. Yes, my mother and my aunt and uncle back on Tatooine. And you love them, do you not? Of course, Anakin says a little too hotly. He steadies himself, then replies, yes, more calmly. A Jedi must not know attachments outside of the Order, the Grand Master explains. At your feelings on this, I wonder. At this, the camera briefly lingers on Anakin's uncomfortable expression. Cut back to the Senate, where Qui-Gon steps up beside Padme and whispers to her. If you will not take my word, Padme tells the body, then perhaps you will listen to the word of a Jedi Master. Many of the senators gasp, and Qui-Gon begins speaking. What Queen Amidala says is true. The Naboo were not behind the attacks. They had no reason to do so, for they knew that I and another of my order had been sent to mediate between them and the Trade Federation on behalf of the Chancellor. Are you saying, another senator asks, that Chancellor Valorum sent two Jedi to intervene without the approval of the Senate. We get a shot of Valorum looking unsettled, and Qui-Gon and Padme exchange nervous glances. Standing beside the two of them, Palpatine watches, a hint of a smirk playing across his lips. Now back to the Jedi, where the Council is still deliberating over Anakin's fate. He does display promise, Count Dooku notes, and though he is older than those we typically take in, it is not unheard of for someone his age to begin training. And you are forgetting. He would have Qui-Gon for a master. That, Kiari Mundi says, does not exactly allay my concerns. As the debate continues, we see the council gradually turning against Anakin, as his face grows more and more frustrated. Back in the Senate, we see Anakin's frustration mirrored in Padme's expression. So, the Nemoidian senator announces, the Chancellor has conspired with the Jedi to usurp the authority of this body. How can we expect our concerns to be handled with fairness in the face of this revelation? Padme looks to Valorum, who is growing increasingly concerned. Suddenly, the Chancellor moves to address the Senate himself. In light of these recent accusations, I propose that a new committee be established in order to further investigate the recent events on Naboo. And I assure both the Naboo and Nemoidian delegations that both sides will be represented fairly in the proceedings. At this, Padme's expression falls. I have no faith in this system to save my people, she mutters to Qui-Gon. As the Chancellor waits for her response, she stares at him, the anger in her eyes giving way to sorrow. I propose a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum, Padme announces. The Chancellor's eyes widen as the Senate goes silent. Cut back to Anakin, who stands nervously before the Council. The various masters exchange glances, Mace Windu nods at Yoda, while Count Dooku looks upset. 
Yoda then speaks. I am afraid that we will not be taking young Skywalker in. Anakin's eyes flit from master to master, and he curtly excuses himself before stalking out of the room. Obi-Wan hesitates for a moment, thanks the masters for their time, and bows before following Anakin. Back in the Senate, the Speaker announces, The motion of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum has been accepted. Proceedings will begin shortly. Padme exchanges a final glance with her former ally, then departs from the chamber. Senator Palpatine gives her a sad look, but as she walks on, the camera lingers on him, and he smiles. Padme, Obi-Wan, and Anakin soon meet back up, sharing the frustrations of their recent experiences. If no one comes to the aid of my planet soon, Padme says, distraught, many of our leaders will be taken to Cato Nemoidia, while the rest of my people will continue to live under the boot of the Trade Federation. I can't just sit around here waiting while they suffer. And there is also the matter of the Sith, Obi-Wan notes. If they truly are involved in this, then they must be playing at something greater, and we must discover what that is. As the three talk, Qui-Gon approaches. Any luck with the Council? Anakin asks. No, he says. They refuse to allow me to train you, and though they are concerned about the threat the Sith pose, they will not dispatch anyone to Naboo, not when our recent involvement has already strained our relations with the Senate. The Council would prefer to wait until the Sith make their next move. But who knows when or where that might come, Obi-Wan asks, or what price we or others may pay for waiting. My thoughts exactly, my young Padawan, Qui-Gon says with a grim smile. But I do not intend to wait. And I suspect the same of you, your highness, he says, looking to Padme. Wait, Obi-Wan says. Are you suggesting what I think you're suggesting? That we gather up a small team, Padme says. Sneak into the palace on Theed. Liberate my people. And draw out the Sith who have been pulling the strings from the shadows. Qui-Gon concludes, then escape and bring proof of their involvement before both the Council and the Senate. But there are too few of us, Padme says. Only a handful of my security detail made it off Naboo with me. The rest are civil servants or engineers. At this, Qui-Gon smiles. If you're not averse to spending some credits, Your Highness, I do have a few less savory connections that might prove useful. The camera comes to rest on Obi-Wan. I've got a bad feeling about this. Here, Qui-Gon arranges for Padme to meet with a group of bounty hunters that he has had some unspecified contact with in his past. This way, we once again provide a contrast between him and the more orthodox members of the Jedi Council. The leader of this group, Jango Fett, agrees to take on the job. Are you sure you're up for this? Padme asks. You'll be going up against the Trade Federation. So long as I get paid, he replies with a smirk. I don't much care what the job is. The group then goes over the basics of the plan. Utilizing the mercenaries' skills, they will sneak past the Trade Federation blockade and land in the capital, where they will then storm the palace, free the prisoners held there, and take the Viceroy of the Trade Federation hostage. Qui-Gon hopes that the Sith who are involved will then have no choice but to reveal themselves. Are you sure about this, Master? Obi-Wan asks. It could make things worse with the Senate. They were never on our side to begin with, Padme cuts in, and I'm done waiting for someone else to save us. As they prepare to leave, Anakin assumes he will be coming with them, but Qui-Gon is opposed. We're going to be heading into a war zone, son. This is no place for someone like you. Then what? Anakin asks. I should just head back to Tatooine? Forget any of this ever happened? No. He looks to the others. I can fight. I've been fighting all my life and I'm not about to let all of you run into harm's way without me. Qui-Gon looks to Obi-Wan, who nods approvingly, and the Master relents. Stick close to me, he says. Jango butts in, and stay out of all way. Anakin grins, and looks to Padme, who smiles back, then nods to the others. Let's move. The company then departs aboard that ship, and makes the jump to Naboo. As they arrive, the Trade Federation fleet still orbits the planet, though some ships are being allowed to pass through the blockade. Is that going to be a problem? Anakin asks. Django activates something on his command console, then turns to the others. While I'm masking our signal with one of theirs. It's a low-level trick, but it should get us past their scanners, especially since no one's shooting. Yet. The ship proceeds towards the fleet, 
and several characters look out a window at the nearest Trade Federation battleship as they slowly pass by. A few exchange nervous glances, but after another minute they successfully pass through the blockade and begin descending towards the planet's surface. Landing on the outskirts of Thede, Padme then leads the group into the capital, sneaking past a number of droid patrols with the aid of the Jedi. They approach the palace, then infiltrate it, heading for the holding areas. Here, they find not only the officials Padme was hoping to save, but a number of technicians, pilots, and her security detail, and the Queen updates her plan. Dispatching some of the soldiers to cause a distraction outside the main gate, she instructs the pilots to try to break through a weak point in the blockade and buy enough time for shuttles with the civilians to get out. Agreeing, the group heads for the hangars. The civilians begin boarding the few available shuttles as the pilots and technicians prepare the starfighters. As they do so, one of Padme's advisors urges her to come with them. There is no need to remain behind, your highness. No, she tells him. My job is not done here, and I don't intend to let them capture me again. As they speak, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan both look up, and just afterwards the rear doors open to reveal a figure in black robes. Darth Maul strides forward, lowers his hood, and ignites one side of his lightsaber, then the other. The two Jedi tell the others that they will handle the Sith. Padme and the mercenaries head for the Viceroy, while the pilots clamber into the fighters in the hangar. Anakin climbs aboard one as well, with R2-D2 joining him, and as he sits down in the cockpit, he remarks that the controls are not too different from the pod racers he's been flying for years. When he starts up the ship, he has some trouble maneuvering it out of the hangar, but soon gets it mostly under control. The two Jedi then begin dueling Darth Maul, while Padme, Fett, and the others storm the central portion of the palace, fighting their way through waves of droids. Jango and the other mercenaries have access to ion weapons, which allows them to deal with the droidicas that the Viceroy has protecting him. Meanwhile, as Anakin and the other pilots race into the skies, the squadron leader announces that his scanners have found a weak point in the blockade. Just one battleship in this sector, he reports. We should have a few minutes before they're able to get reinforcements here, so let's make it count. Are the shuttles ready? We're right behind you, the lead shuttle pilot announces, and we get a shot of some of the freed hostages glancing nervously between each other. As the squadron encounters the first wave of droid ships and a dogfight ensues, we cut back and forth between the aerial battle, the duel between the Jedi and the Sith, and Padme's team storming the palace. The latter group reaches the blast doors outside the central chamber, and bursts in to find Newt Gunray cowering. Amidala quickly subdues him, and instructs Gunray to order his forces to stand down. We then cut to several other Trade Federation officials in another part of the city, who stand before a hologram of Lord Sidious. The Queen has captured the Viceroy, they tell him, and is demanding that we stand down. What should we do? If he has allowed himself to be captured, Sidious says, then he is no longer of use to us. Destroy the Naboo forces and eliminate the Queen. I no longer require her alive. He ends the connection, and we cut back to the dogfight raging high above the city. Anakin and R2 have a little back and forth as they battle the waves of droid fighters, but the squadron does manage to buy enough time for the shuttles to get free. Their mission accomplished, they race back towards the surface to aid the ground forces as more droids chase them. Meanwhile, Maul continues to hold his own against the two Jedi, seemingly untroubled, and even excited to be battling them. Their duel takes them through the reactor beneath the city, and we cut back to Padme in the central chamber of the palace. They're not standing down, Captain Panaka reports. In fact, it looks like even more droids are converging on the palace. Padme looks at Gunray, who falls to his knees. I ordered them to. Please, your highness, you have to believe... Padme knocks him unconscious with the handle of her blaster, then turns to the mercenaries. We may need a new plan. You think? One asks, just as a massive explosion rocks the palace. Oh, I don't know about you, Jango tells Amidala, but I intend to get out of this alive. Money's no good to me if I'm not around to spend it. We should make for my ship. You can go, Padme says, but I am not leaving my people. Not again. Cut back to Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan who are being led deeper into the facility by their Sith opponent. Maul starts to show a bit of hesitation, and then turns and flees. Qui-Gon pursues immediately, but Obi-Wan appears a little more cautious. As the two chase after the fleeing Sith, Maul comes to a central chamber with a large control panel. As the Jedi rush in after him, Maul pushes Obi-Wan back with the Force, 
then uses it to push a button, which activates a shield that blocks Obi-Wan from reaching the two. Maul and Qui-Gon then fight one-on-one, -on -one, and after clashing briefly, the Sith impales Qui-Gon with his lightsaber. Obi-Wan screams as he watches his master fall to the floor, and Maul turns his gaze on the distraught Padawan. Above ground, the Naboo security forces at the palace entrance are being overrun, and retreat inside, where they regroup with their queen. Barricading themselves behind a blast door, they prepare to make their final stand. Overhead, the fighter squadron are likewise being swarmed by droid craft. Anakin's starfighter suffers a hit, then another, and he grimaces as one of his allies is shot down. Cut back to Obi-Wan, who forces himself to sit and begins meditating, while Maul, on the other side of the shield, paces back and forth, eyeing him like a frenzied animal. Maul then disables the shield, and Obi-Wan lunges out at him, and the two resume their duel. Maul forces him back, but as the Sith locks sabers with him, bearing down with all his might, we see Obi-Wan's gaze go to his master's prone form nearby. Qui-Gon's head lifts, and his hand stirs, and then, using the Force, he throws his lightsaber to Obi-Wan, who catches it and deftly slices Maul in half. Back in the air, Anakin's fighter suffers yet another hit, fire engulfing one of the wings, when he glances up to see even more ships descending, only to realize that they are Republic vessels. The Trade Federation fighters soon disengage, and we cut to Padme's forces, who suddenly realize that the droids have stopped attempting to breach the doors. Their comms arrays come online, and they learn that a Republic peacekeeping force has arrived, and that the Federation is standing down. Cut back to Obi-Wan underground, who rushes to Qui-Gon's side and listens to his master's dying wish, that he train Anakin in Qui-Gon's stead. Obi-Wan makes him a promise, and we then return to the surface, where the Naboo celebrate as the Republic force lands. Palpatine disembarks from one of the ships, accompanied by a retinue of Senate Guard, and approaches Padme. Senator, she greets him, still shocked. It looks like you got here just in time. Queen Amidala, he responds. I figured it best to make a good first impression in my new role, as Supreme Chancellor. She expresses her surprise, and he smiles. Do not worry. I assure you, the Republic will be quite different under my stewardship. Back at the Jedi Temple, Obi-Wan is promoted to the rank of Jedi Knight for his actions in defeating a Sith, and, after relaying Qui-Gon's dying wish to the Council, they reluctantly agree to let Anakin become Obi-Wan's Padawan. The two young Jedi celebrate the news before we cut to Qui-Gon's funeral, which takes place at sunset. As the fallen master's body is consumed by flames, Yoda and Mace Windu speak quietly. The former expresses concern that where one Sith is found, there always lurks another. One apprentice and one master. As he says this, the camera lingers on Palpatine, staring into the flames at the edge of the group of onlookers. Finally, we conclude with a victory parade in Theed, with the newly elected Supreme Chancellor presiding. The atmosphere is triumphant as the main characters join together in celebration, unaware that the titular character, Palpatine, is the true victor in all of this. With this revised version of Episode 1, we have established the three central characters, Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Padme Amidala, and begun to define the dynamic between them. Anakin clearly possesses a great deal of attachment and ambition, which will lead to conflict when the more reserved and traditionally minded Obi-Wan is assigned as his master. Additionally, we build upon the connection between Padme and Anakin here, making their later romance more believable while mirroring their stories. Both are young, idealistic people hoping to make a difference that grow increasingly frustrated by the numerous obstacles in their way. We have also established the underlying rifts that will eventually tear the Republic apart. The Senate is mired in corruption and deadlock, creating a demand for drastic reform if not outright secession, while tensions between the Jedi Council and the Senate are rising. Even the Jedi themselves are not of one mind with masters such as Qui-Gon Jinn and Count Dooku holding unorthodox views that put them at odds with the leadership of the Order. We get a glimpse of how Palpatine is orchestrating much of the chaos, or at least exacerbating it, to serve his own agenda, playing both sides while presenting himself as a savior to the ordinary people of the Republic. With that, let's move on to Episode 2.
We open with a shot of a ship in space, approaching the planet of Coruscant. On board, Senator Padme Amidala of Naboo speaks with Mon Mothma, one of her allies in the Senate. In the face of the growing separatist crisis, the issue of a Grand Army of the Republic looms large, but Amidala, for all she values the Republic, opposes its creation. She believes it to be too dangerous to give that much power to any one person or group, and she still hopes for a diplomatic resolution with the separatists. As Mothma comments that Padme should exercise caution, she responds, Don't worry, I still have a few friends in the capital. Cut to Anakin, who lies asleep in bed. He begins to shift and shudder, and we get brief glimpses of his nightmare. He sees his family's farmstead on Tatooine, then hears shouts and sounds of a struggle, and catches a glimpse of his mother screaming. The vision ends with a figure igniting a lightsaber, and Anakin wakes up. Traveling through the darkened corridors of the Jedi Temple, Anakin goes to speak with Yoda, but the Grand Master of the Jedi Order is already speaking with Mace Windu. Yoda in particular is deeply troubled by the defection of his former apprentice, Count Dooku, and though the two try to offer Anakin some counsel, their distracted states allow them to do little to assuage his fears. Anakin leaves the temple and wanders to the nearby Senate building, where he soon comes across Chancellor Palpatine, who is approaching one of the landing pads with a retinue of guards and ministers. Anakin, the Chancellor greets him warmly. It's good to see you. I take it your training is going well? Here we can establish that the two of them already speak semi-regularly, and that Anakin, though friends with Obi-Wan, still does not believe that his master and the other Jedi see in him the same ability that Palpatine seems to recognize. As they continue, Palpatine brings up the Separatists, and the discussion surrounding the formation of a Grand Army. This matter in the Senate, with the clone army, you understand why it is necessary, do you not? Anakin says that he isn't sure, that it isn't really the place of the Jedi to involve themselves in such matters. Come now, Anakin. The Jedi are the guardians of the Republic, and that duty entails defending it against all its foes. The Council surely dwell upon these matters, even if they are wont to admit it. For all we like to dress ourselves up, at the end of the day, the only way to truly protect the things we care about is with power of our own. He pauses, and steps aside with Anakin while the rest of his retinue waits. I take it you've heard of this business with Count Dooku. Quite unprecedented for someone of his position to leave the Order. I wonder what drove him to choose this path. Just remember, Anakin, he says, laying a hand on the young Jedi's shoulder. The Jedi are wise indeed, but they may not possess all the answers. Just then, one of the others steps in. Your Excellency, the Senator's ship is about to land. Ah, yes. Senator Ramadala is arriving just ahead of the vote. You are welcome to come along if you'd like. Anakin's face brightens at the mention of Padme, and he chooses to accompany Palpatine to the landing pad, where Amidala's ship lands in the early hours of the morning. As Padme's ship descends, we see a shadowy figure observing from nearby, and cut to a shot of a small device on part of the landing pad. As the craft touches down and the ramp lowers, Padme and a group of others accompany her out. We cut back to the watchful figure, then the device once more, as it begins blinking. Padme starts walking towards Palpatine and the others, and we see concern flash across Anakin's face. He leaps forward and pushes Padme and some of the others aside just as a massive explosion tears through the side of the ship. As security forces hurry the Chancellor inside and secure the area, Anakin rushes to Padme's side. After the two get to safety, she thanks him for saving her, and remarks on how much she has grown since the two last met. You must be quite the powerful Jedi, Padme tells him. If only you were on the council, he jokingly remarks. We see a hint of annoyance in his eyes, but this quickly passes. In all seriousness, it's good to see you again, Padme. Cut to a shot of the Senate chamber where various senators are busy debating the formation of the Grand Army of the Republic and discussing the growing separatist movement ahead of the vote. Here, we learn a few key details, that an army of nearly two million clones has been ordered from Kamino and is on the verge of being ready for deployment, that other planets are producing the weapons, vehicles, and armor necessary to equip this army, and that the issue of whether or not the Supreme Chancellor will have ultimate command of the army is being hotly contested. Mon Mothma speaks, arguing that it would be a grave threat to democracy to grant anyone this level of power, while a pro-Palpatine senator retorts by asking how the Republic can hope to endure without an army to defend itself against outside threats, such as the one it is now facing. 
As the debate rages, we cut to a shot of Palpatine standing amidst the proceedings, watching with feigned solemnity. Now cut to Obi-Wan and Anakin, who stand before Mace Windu, one of the few Jedi who has remained on Coruscant in the face of the crisis. He tells them that the issue of the army is of great concern to the Council, and that as such they must protect the significant figures involved in it, among them Senator Amidala. He assigns the two to protect her, as the Jedi fear that another attempt on her life is imminent. Obi-Wan expresses his doubts that they are suited to this job, though Anakin is eager to accept. As they depart, we get some back and forth between them, with Obi-Wan trying to act as both a friend and mentor, though the two roles often come into conflict. Above all, he seeks to fulfill his promise to Qui-Gon, though Anakin does on occasion seem to resent Obi-Wan's authority over him. The two enter Padme's quarters, where the senator is speaking with her security detail. She informs the Jedi that she has an idea of how to draw out her assassins. Anakin is against the plan, believing it to be too much of a risk, but Obi-Wan is more accepting, and Padme convinces the former. She plans to act as bait while the Jedi and her security detail lie in wait. That night, the two Jedi stand and wait outside the room, while through a window, we see a silhouette moving. Cut to outside the room, where a shadowy figure watches from afar. The assassin, Zam Wessel, mutters something into a comms device on her wrist before lifting a rifle. She examines the window, shakes her head, and reaches for a detonator. Cut back to Obi-Wan and Anakin, who are waiting in silence. Anakin suddenly leaps up, sensing that something is amiss, and walks down the hallway. Obi-Wan hesitantly follows him, arguing that they should not be straying far, but Anakin seems to sense another assassin nearby. Cut to the window by Padme's bedside, where we can see a figure approaching the bed. The window then explodes, and moments later Zam rushes in, only to find a droid wearing Amidala's clothing. Padme's security forces confront the assassin, and she fires back, striking Captain Panaka before fleeing as Obi-Wan and Anakin race in. Zam hops onto a speeder and zooms away, and the two Jedi pursue in a vehicle of their own. After chasing the assassin through the city, Anakin and Obi-Wan finally corner her in a club, but Zam, a shapeshifter, is able to blend into the crowd. Obi-Wan finds some of her discarded armor, then closes his eyes, using the Force to sense her amongst the others. He whirls around just as she lunges at him with a knife, but Anakin likewise leaps from the crowd to stop her. The two Jedi subdue the assassin and bring her out to their speeder as the stunned clubgoers look on. Setting her down beside their speeder, Obi-Wan begins to question Zam. Who hired you? And are there more of you? At this she smirks, and her eyes flood up. The two Jedi turn around, then dive for cover as an explosive flies towards them, immolating both their prisoner and vehicle. As Obi-Wan struggles to rise, he spots a figure flying away, a figure bearing a striking resemblance to someone he worked with years before, Jango Fett. Obi-Wan watches through narrowed eyes, wondering, before aiding his Padawan. The two return to Padme's apartment, but upon arriving find the atmosphere solemn. Padme stands over the body of Captain Panaka, who died preventing the assassin from reaching her. I was so concerned with the threat to myself, Padme remarks. I didn't stop to consider who else I was placing in harm's way. In the aftermath, Padme decides to return to Naboo to prevent anyone else from dying for her sake, leaving one of her subordinates to fill her role as senator. The camera lingers on this replacement, and we cut to Palpatine, who sits in his office, smiling. Before him stand Yoda and Mace Windu, who are discussing new details about the Separatist movement and their leader, Count Dooku. There is the matter of Senator Amidala, Palpatine cuts in. Though we do not see eye to eye on the matter of the Grand Army, she is an old friend, and we have weathered many storms together. I fear the threat to her life may not end with her decision to return home, and that someone may use her in an attempt to get to me. There is also the possibility that whoever is after her has some connection to the Separatists. If we can capture them, we may learn more of what our foes are planning. In light of all this, I was hoping that your order might assign some of your own to protect her. Yoda and Windu share a look, and he goes on. Kenobi and Skywalker have already proven themselves able in this regard, and Senator Amidala has long been a friend of the Jedi and a stalwart of the Republic. If we don't protect those closest to us in these trying times, how can we hope to win the faith of the galaxy at large? Yoda and Windu once again look to each other, and we cut to a ship on a landing pad, as Obi-Wan and Anakin step into the frame. 
Obi-Wan is skeptical about this being a wise use of the Order's resources, especially with the Jedi already stretched so thin, but Anakin is happy to be close to Padme, though he does try to hide this from his master to some degree. Just try to enjoy yourself, master, he tells Obi-Wan. Think of it as a well-earned vacation. Padme welcomes the pair aboard, and the ship soon lifts off. After arriving on Naboo, our heroes set up in the palace, with Obi-Wan and Anakin sharing quarters. The two discuss their training, with Obi-Wan stating that he is proud to see how much progress Anakin has made, but Anakin wishes to learn more, and feels that he is being held back. By refusing to accept power, he tells his master, the Jedi only leave the galaxy vulnerable to those who don't share our reservations. Just look at the debates in the Senate. The Republic wavered for too long, and now the Separatists have taken advantage of our weakness. At least Palpatine seems to understand this, even if we don't. Obi-Wan gets a worried look. Power has a tendency to become an end in and of itself, my young Padawan, even in those who originally possessed the noblest of intentions. What about Master Windu? Anakin asks. The Jedi preach detachment and ridding ourselves of emotion, and yet he channels his rage and emotion, uses them to fuel himself, and no one can best him with a lightsaber. He is a master, Anakin, Obi-Wan responds, with decades of experience. And even so, his style is still controversial among many on the Council. In that way, he shed some similarities with my old master. At the mention of Qui-Gon, both of them grow somber. I wish he was still here, Anakin. He was the one who was meant to train you, not me. But I have done my best, and I will continue to do so. You are still young, but you have a bright future ahead of you. The Council sees it, even if they are reluctant to admit it. Anakin nods, then leaves. Later, he approaches Padme. She asks if he's alright, and he blankly answers that he's fine. When she presses him, he eventually admits that he's frustrated by the Jedi Council's refusal to make him a knight. They need all the help they can get right now, he says, and yet still they hold me back. Well, Padme tells him, it takes years to master any skill, let alone something as important as being a Jedi. And anyways, you're helping them right now. You're protecting me. He smiles at her, but his expression quickly clouds over once more. I just... I feel... trapped, in a way. I love being a Jedi, but... sometimes... the code... it's so strict. They prohibit any kind of attachments outside of the Order, even to our own families. He pauses, then turns back to face her, speaking low. Can I show you something? Promise that you won't tell anyone. She nods, and he retrieves his mother's necklace. My mother gave this to me, on the day I left Tatooine. I haven't ever been able to return, but at least I still have something to remember her by. He closes his hand into a fist around it. If the others found out, I'm sure they'd be mad, but I'd never let them take it. They can have everything else, but not this. That night, as the group eats dinner, Obi-Wan watches as Padme and Anakin converse. We get a sense that Obi-Wan suspects something between them, but he remains silent. Several days pass, and there is still no sign of the assassins. Padme and Anakin grow quite relaxed in each other's company, while Obi-Wan worries about whether he is properly filling Qui-Gon's shoes. He has a flashback to just before he and his old master departed for Naboo, recalling Qui-Gon's words. Should I fall, I trust that you will watch after Anakin in my place. The boy is special. The force is strong in him. Obi-Wan is snapped back to the present by the sound of his transponder, and goes outside to answer. He reports that there have been no signs of danger, and is then requested to travel to Kamino to look into something for the Jedi Council ahead of the clone army being ready for deployment. That night, Anakin has another nightmare about his mother, and after waking begins wandering the compound, where he once more runs into Padme. He confides in her that he worries about his family, but that part of him is ashamed of it as it's not the Jedi way. She tells him that there is nothing wrong with being concerned for the ones you love, and delicately takes his hand in her own. In the morning, Obi-Wan informs the others that he is needed on urgent business on Kamino, and that the Council is confident that Padme will be safe without his presence. Before he leaves, he pulls Anakin aside, and tells his Padawan that he trusts he will do his duty as a Jedi. As Anakin listens to him, his gaze goes to Padme, Obi-Wan then departs, and arrives in orbit around the ocean planet of Kamino. 
Landing in a massive platform amidst the stormy seas, he is greeted by the Kaminoian minister overseeing the cloning operation. She invites him into the facility, and here we get some more exposition on the clones through the eyes of Obi-Wan. The minister informs the Jedi that the clones are engineered to develop twice as fast as normal humans, and are conditioned to be absolutely loyal. When Obi-Wan asks, to whom? She simply responds, to the Republic, of course. She also states that our partners in the program have recently fulfilled their obligations in terms of manufacturing weapons, armor, and equipment. The two then come to an overlook, where thousands of clones are receiving rifles and armor. Obi-Wan remarks that this has all been a massive undertaking, and the minister responds, Yes, more than a decade in the making. The program was begun under the administration of your previous chancellor, Valorum. Interestingly enough, it was your current chancellor, then Senator Palpatine, who oversaw the details of our arrangement. Obi-Wan expresses surprise at this, and the camera focuses on his expression as his eyes narrow. Cut back to Anakin, who is still on Naboo. As he sleeps, he experiences yet another nightmare, this one far more vivid, involving shadowy figures dragging his mother away. Her screams echo in his ears, and he shouts for her as she fades into the black. Rage comes over his face, and he ignites his lightsaber. Waking up in a darkened room, he goes outside, where the planet lays quiet in the pre-dawn hours. As he sits there, staring into the shadows beyond the compound, we hear Palpatine's voice. The only way to truly protect the things we care about is with power of our own. Later that morning, Padme finds Anakin sitting alone outside, deep in contemplation. Sensing that something is clearly wrong, she coaxes him into admitting that he has been having nightmares. But they feel more real than just nightmares, he confesses. I know something has happened. And yet my vows, if your mother is in danger, Padme butts in, you can't just sit around here. You need to go to her. I'm sure the Jedi will understand, but they won't. We're supposed to leave everything else behind when we enter the Order. And besides, I've been assigned to protect you. I can't just leave you here alone. Padme watches him for a moment, an idea forming in her mind. Take me with you. We can go to your family's home together. He starts to protest, but she presses him. Think about it. It's the last place the people who are after me would expect me to go. Anakin looks away, then back at her. I don't care what the Jedi teach, she tells him. If we can't protect the people we love, all the vows in the galaxy are worthless. She lays a hand on his shoulder. If we go, Anakin responds, his voice hesitant. You can't tell Obi-Wan, or anyone else. I promise, Padme tells him. This will stay between us. Back on Kamino, Obi-Wan continues walking with the minister, seeing more of the facility. She states that 1.8 million clones are on the cusp of readiness, with more on the way. As we see younger clones going through Indoc and embryos gestating in tubes, the minister mentions that the template for the program is a bounty hunter who was screened for his suitability before selection. An excellent choice, if I do say so myself. Though his method of payment was rather unusual, at least for what would be expected of one in his line of work. A single clone, unaltered. He is here now, if you would like to meet him. Obi-Wan responds that he would, and the two continue on. Cut to Tatooine, where Padme's ship descends outside the Lars family homestead. Anakin and Padme enter, where they are greeted by a somber Owen and Beru. The two explain that Anakin's mother was recently captured by a group of Tusken raiders while traveling back from the nearest town. They took her just before she got back, within sight of the homestead, Owen says. I tried to go after him, but there were too many. Anakin, distraught, asks if they've tried to find her or get help. But Owen says, no one is willing to help. No one cares. Anakin lifts his lightsaber, flexes his fingers around it, and then looks back up his expression dark, his eyes alight with rage. Without a word, he heads for the door. Cut back to Kamino, where the minister brings Obi-Wan to a smaller room and knocks at the door. After a moment, it opens, and a young boy greets them. Hello, Boba, she says. Is your father here? No, he replies, but he should be back soon. Obi-Wan looks curiously at the boy as he and the minister exchange pleasantries, but then the kid's expression brightens, and he calls out for his father. 
and Obi-Wan turns to see Jango Fett standing down the hallway, rigid. The two stare at each other, and Obi-Wan recalls seeing him the night of Padme's assassination attempt on Coruscant. Son, Jango says tensely, get to the ship. Now. Obi-Wan urges the bounty hunter to surrender himself, but Jango replies, it's not gonna happen. Jango reaches for a blaster and fires, and before Obi-Wan can react, the bounty hunter flees down a hallway, with his young son heading in a different direction. And a brief fight breaks out in the exterior of the facility as Jango heads for his ship. Here we get to see how skilled he is in combat, being able to hold his own against a Jedi Knight. Back on Tatooine, Anakin races across the darkened desert on a speeder, his mind filling with flashes of his mother suffering, and of her captors, and then of their village. His eyes narrowing, he tightens his grip on the controls and increases his speed, seeming to sense through the force the location of his mother and her captors. Eventually, he slows down, and comes to a halt just outside a small village of tents. The settlement lays quiet in the dark of night, and Anakin sneaks inside, quickly finding his mother. She lays mutilated on a bed of bloodied cloth, and he rushes to her side and lifts her in his arms. His mother barely has the strength to recognize him, but she manages to whisper, I knew you'd come for me. Tearfully, Anakin tells her, I'll get you out of here. I'll bring you home, and I'll make sure nothing like this ever happens again. She reaches a hand to his face, and mutters, Be strong for me, Annie. Her strength then ebbs, and the light fades from her eyes, and Anakin, distraught, attempts to get her to respond. Cradling his mother's lifeless body, with tears streaming down his face, Anakin looks up, and his countenance contorts with rage. Lowering her body delicately to the floor, he staggers to his feet and retrieves his lightsaber. Then, stepping out into the darkness beyond the tent, he ignites it. Cut back to Kamino, where Jango is approaching his ship. Obi-Wan nearly throws him from the platform with the Force, but Boba, who has already made it to the Slave One, fires at the Jedi with a turret and gives his father a chance to use his jetpack to save himself. Jango climbs aboard, and the ship blasts off but not before Obi-Wan has a chance to put a tracker on it. He races back to his own ship, passing the very confused Kaminoian minister in the process. Just an old friend, he tells her apologetically. Hurrying outside, he climbs aboard his own starfighter and gives pursuit, managing to trail Fett to the Geonosis system. Here, he lands outside a massive facility and activates a distress beacon before sneaking inside. Maneuvering through what he soon discovers is a sprawling droid factory, Obi-Wan enters the ventilation system and comes to a point above a large conference room where a number of the Separatist movement's leaders are gathered. He recognizes one amongst them in an instant, Count Dooku. Hundreds more systems have pledged to join us, Dooku tells the gathering. Faith in the decrepit bureaucracy of the Republic is crumbling. We stand upon the cusp of a new era of prosperity for the galaxy. Various organizations pledge their support to Dooku's cause, and Obi-Wan, alarmed by what he has overheard, sneaks away, only to be quickly stunned by a group of elite droids and captured. Cut back to Tatooine, where a morose, silent Anakin returns to the Lars homestead, exchanging glances with his aunt and uncle before secluding himself away. Eventually, Padme approaches him, and he reveals to her that he was too late to save his mother. If I had just been a little stronger... He whispers, a little more powerful, I might have been able to save her. At this, Padme puts a hand on his cheek, then kisses him. We then cut to a shot of the dual sun setting over the dunes, and then to the following morning, where Anakin receives Obi-Wan's distress signal from Geonosis. He informs Padme, and tells her that he can't let another person he cares about die. I may have been too late to save my mother, but it's not too late to save him. Padme agrees, and the two bid farewell to Anakin's family. As they go, Owen Lars mentions that he couldn't help but overhear that they were heading into danger, and gives them a gift. His old protocol droid, C-3PO. Anakin did most of the work on him anyway, and I haven't had much use for him lately, he tells the two. Who knows, maybe he'll come in handy. Cut back to Geonosis, where Obi-Wan wakes up, suspended in a force field. He struggles briefly against his restraints, then tenses as the door opens, 
and watches as Count Dooku strides into the room confidently. Obi-Wan watches the enigmatic former Jedi for a moment before the latter finally breaks the silence. So, the Republic has resorted to sending assassins after us now. Not that it surprises me. Little does these days. I have no words for you, traitor, Obi-Wan tells him. Oh, is that so? Dooku asks with a chuckle. The Jedi have always blinded themselves to the true threats arrayed against them, and been ever eager to cast aspersions on those who would deliver them from these foes. Save your lies. If you truly believed in helping people, you wouldn't have turned your back on the Republic. The Republic? You only reveal how little you know. Dooku faces away. I suppose I might as well enlighten you. He turns back. Would it surprise you, Kenobi, to learn that as we speak, a Sith Lord currently has influence over hundreds of members of the Senate? Obi-Wan's shock quickly gives way to mistrust. That... that cannot be true. The Jedi would have sensed their influence. Dooku smirks. Perhaps in a prior age, when the Jedi had not allowed their vision to become so clouded. That is why I have chosen this path. I aim to form a fairer system of government, one that can respond to the needs of the people of the galaxy. All tyrants cloak their aspirations in altruism, Obi-Wan shoots back. As all fools dismiss contrary viewpoints as madness. Dooku pauses, then steps closer. You know, your old master, Qui-Gon, he saw things differently. A true Jedi, a remnant of a greater era. He would have listened to what I have to say. Enough, Obi-Wan shouts. Either kill me or release me, but know this, I will never join you. A shame, Dooku remarks. You have great potential, but like the rest, you squander it. He departs, and Obi-Wan glares at his retreating figure. From here we follow Count Dooku outside. He enters a command room where a subordinate informs him that they have detected another ship entering the atmosphere. A Republic vessel? It appears to be unmarked, my lord. And it's just the one. Jam their communications, Dooku instructs. We don't want word escaping just yet. But don't shoot them down unless they try to flee. He turns and sees Jango Fett approaching, clad in armor. Let's give our new guests a warm welcome, shall we? At this, Jango smirks and dons his helmet. Cut to Padme's ship, which lands next to Obi-Wan's. Anakin and Padme exit and explore their immediate surroundings, but Obi-Wan is nowhere to be found. Instructing C-3PO and R2-D2 to wait on the ship, the pair covertly enter the facility. They are soon detected, and a brief fight breaks out between them and several droids, until Jango Fett manages to get the drop on Padme and convinces Anakin to hand over his lightsaber. Padme recognizes Fett from years before, and asks if he has any qualms with handing over an old comrade. He smiles apologetically at her. Like I told you back then, I don't much care what the job is, so long as I get paid. Anakin and Padme are brought to the same room that Obi-Wan is being held in, and the latter expresses surprise at their arrival, and then anger. What are you doing here? He asks Anakin. Rescuing you. Well, you've done a great job of that, haven't you? You were supposed to be guarding her. Is this your idea of a secure location? We got your distress signal, Anakin says. Was I just supposed to ignore it? Perhaps you could have informed the Order, like a loyal Padawan is supposed to do. You aren't the only Jedi in the galaxy, you know. Well, if you... Stop it, Padme cuts in. It was my choice to come here as much as his. You shouldn't be so hard on him. He was only trying to help. Just then, Dooku enters the room. I am sorry to cut short this touching reunion, but it appears my compatriots are ready for the proceedings to begin. What proceedings? Padme asks. Your trial, Dooku states. Assassins dispatched by the Senate, aiming to do away with the leadership of the Separatist movement. And on a day of celebration such as this, truly dastardly, I must say. But today the galaxy shall learn the truth, and our movement will formally break with the crumbling ruin you name the Republic. 
and the Confederacy of Independent Systems shall rise from its ashes. Assassins? Anakin asks. That's absurd. I am a sitting member of the Senate, Padme shouts. Not anymore, though. Or am I mistaken? Have you not appointed someone else in your stead? Dooku smirks. But regardless, I am not here to debate with you. Bring them. At this, a group of Geonosians enter, lowering the three from the stasis field and leading them off. Cut back to the ship, where C-3PO and R2-D2 are waiting for Anakin and Padme to return. The former remarks that their owners have been gone a long time, and R2 soon departs from the ship, heading towards the facility. C-3PO chases after him, reminding him that they were supposed to wait, to no avail. Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Padme are brought out into the center of a massive coliseum, where a Geonosian festival is taking place. Amidst the extravagant displays of holograms, equipment, and exotic creatures, the three are brought to a section in the center of the arena, where their bindings are fixed to rods in the ground. Dooku then emerges from a balcony overlooking the Colosseum, flanked by Jango Fett and a number of Separatist leaders, and addresses the proceedings. Today marks the beginning of a new age, of a government that responds to the needs of its people. Today, the Separatist movement will formally declare itself as the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The crowd roars in applause, as the trio of heroes below look on in fear. But of course, Dooku goes on, as with any great changes, there will always be those who stubbornly resist. Before you stand three assassins dispatched by the Republic, entrusted with the sinister mission of silencing your leaders. But fear not, for we have captured them, and now we lay bare their crimes before the galaxy for all to witness. This is how the Republic deals with dissent. This is how the Senate acts against those who dare challenge its monopoly over the lives of the people of the galaxy. But no more. The crowd roars again, and Obi-Wan and Anakin share a look. Back in the facility, the two droids sneak through an area where countless super battle droids are being assembled, and then come to a room filled with exotic creatures and cages, guarded by a few Geonosians. R2 beeps quietly, then moves forward. C-3PO glances around nervously, and mutters, I've got a bad feeling about this. Back in the Colosseum, the center is gradually cleared of all the other attendants, until only the trio of heroes and a number of Geonosian and battle droid guards remain. Dooku smiles, but then we hear a deep rumbling, and he and the other Separatist leaders on the balcony glance around in confusion, only for several giant creatures to burst into the center of the Colosseum. They slaughter the Geonosians and droids around the Jedi and Padme, and the three heroes scramble to escape their bindings, dodging the creature's strikes. As the two Jedi fight the beasts, Anakin and Obi-Wan reconcile, and are able to work together to bring down one of the creatures. Padme, meanwhile, grabs a droid blaster and defends herself, while Dooku, looking on in anger, dispatches more droids into the Colosseum. The creatures are soon defeated, leaving Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Padme surrounded by droids. Just as it seems hopeless, however, a number of lightsabers ignite amongst the crowd of onlookers, and the Geonosian attendees flee into the skies. The newly arrived Jedi join the fight, and the Separatist leaders begin to panic. As a battle rages in the Colosseum, the leader of the Jedi ground forces, Mace Windu, attempts to rally his warriors. Up on the balcony, Jango Fett kills a young Jedi Knight who comes after Dooku, then jumps into the fray. Mace and Jango soon come face to face, and Windu quickly decapitates the bounty hunter. The fight drags on, with more and more droids flooding into the area. As the embattled Jedi are on the verge of being overrun, Anakin glances up to see a number of ships descending from above, only to recognize them as Republic gunships loaded with clone troopers. The army encircles the Jedi and aids them in evacuating, as further above, more Republic cruisers can be seen exiting hyperspace. As Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Padme board a gunship, they speak with Palpatine via hologram, who remarks that it looks like once again his forces have arrived just in time. As it turns out, the Senate has approved his control over the army, and granted him emergency powers to quell the fledgling Separatist movement. Padme gives Anakin a worried glance, but he looks relieved. The clone army begins assaulting the droid factories on the surface, from which hordes of battle droids are emerging. 
Mace Windu takes command of the ground forces, while Obi-Wan and Anakin, after convincing Padme to remain behind, take off after the fleeing Dooku, hoping to cut the head off the Confederacy before it truly has a chance to form. Chasing Dooku into a structure, the two Jedi confront him, and he finally retrieves a lightsaber of his own and ignites it. A red lightsaber. Obi-Wan advises caution, but Anakin rushes in, and the two battle Dooku briefly, though he clearly has the upper hand. He flings Obi-Wan away using the Force, and Anakin strikes at him, only for Dooku to sever Anakin's hand. He then begins to overwhelm Obi-Wan, but when the embattled Jedi is on the verge of defeat, Dooku's attention shifts, and we see Mace Windu enter. The two lock sabers in a flurry of light as Obi-Wan rushes to Anakin's side and helps his Padawan up. And here, Anakin gets to see firsthand what a lightsaber duel fueled by rage looks like. Mace Windu slashes at Dooku with fury, and Anakin watches in fascination. We even see a flicker of envy in his eyes. Dooku then slashes at the machinery around him, causing a chain reaction and sending a mass of debris hurtling towards the two young Jedi. Windu uses the Force to halt it, saving them but allowing Dooku a chance to escape. As the Separatist ships take off, and the clones mop up the remaining droid ground forces, Count Dooku, on board one of the vessels, enters a room alone and activates a hologram. He then bows before Lord Sidious, and informs him, You will have your war. In the aftermath, Padme and Anakin are reunited. She expresses concern over his loss of a hand, and Obi-Wan notices the passion in her expression, and in the interactions between the two. Back on Coruscant, Obi-Wan speaks before the Jedi Council, relaying to them what Dooku told him about a Sith Lord being in control of hundreds of senators. Meanwhile, Anakin, now with a robotic prosthetic hand, marries Padme in a secret ceremony, while Palpatine and a number of his allies in the Senate oversee a parade of the Republic's new clone army on the streets of the capital before a cheering crowd. I don't know what to make of Dooku's warning, Obi-Wan admits. Could it be a diversion? Some ploy by our foes to goad us into acting rashly? Or could there be truth to his words? Some dark influence is clearly at play amongst us, Windu says. I have sensed it, though the Force remains clouded. I fear that whatever his reasons, Dooku's warning was no lie. Yoda agrees, and they wonder as to the nature of who this Sith Lord might be. Could he be connected to Palpatine? asks Shakti. I don't sense anything from him, Windu says, but he could certainly be involved. Perhaps he is merely an unwitting puppet in some greater game. As he says this, we cut back to Anakin, who embraces Padme. Regardless of who is involved, Windu continues, we must root out this evil before it has a chance to spread. We must act delicately, Kiyadi Mundi comments. Our relations with the Senate are already strained as it is. Then we are in agreement, Yoda states. Obi-Wan looks on with a worried expression, and the camera cuts back to Chancellor Palpatine, standing before cheering throngs of citizens as thousands of clone troopers march by. Palpatine smirks, and we cut to a shot of Anakin and Padme looking out over the city together. Anakin's prosthetic hand clutches the necklace his mother gave him, and the camera rests here for a moment before the credits roll. With our revisions to Episode 2, we accomplish several key points. Introducing the concept of Anakin questioning many aspects of the Jedi Code in his quest for power, which he justifies as being necessary to protect the people he cares about, highlighting the differences in attitude between him and his master Obi-Wan, even as the two remain close friends, moving the relationship between Anakin and Padme from friendship into full-blown romance, giving the former an even more powerful motivating factor to continue to stray from the path of the Jedi, demonstrating how, under duress, Anakin will take drastic actions that put him at odds with the Order, and developing the connection between Anakin and Palpatine, who begins to fill the role of a father figure in the former's life. Additionally, we explore both how the Separatists have amassed so much support and how Chancellor Palpatine has used the crisis to his own advantage. And with all of that, it's time to move on to the final installment of our revised trilogy.
We open with a shot following two starfighters, belonging to Obi-Wan and Anakin, as they travel past a Republic cruiser and then emerge into a massive space battle over the Republic capital of Coruscant. The Separatists have launched a major offensive, striking at the heart of the Republic, and we spend two or three minutes with the two Jedi as they fight their way through waves of droid ships towards the surface. We then cut to the Senate building, where Chancellor Palpatine sits, calmly observing the battle. Moments later, Jedi Masters Mace Windu and Shock T, along with several knights and a contingent of clones and Senate guards, enter. They inform the Chancellor that he must evacuate immediately, but he assures them that he is quite safe here. Suddenly, the glass shatters and something flies in through the window, and the imposing form of General Grievous towers above the others in the room. He ignites a pair of lightsabers as Shock T pulls the Chancellor to her, and as she and the other Jedi flee, Grievous begins slaughtering the guards. We follow the Jedi for a minute or two as they run and General Grievous pursues, but eventually the droid leader corners them, and here we get to experience the devastating effectiveness of his combat technique. In quick succession he defeats the Jedi Knights, and then, when Mace Windu and Shock T are struggling to hold him off, he utilizes his extra arms, wielding four lightsabers, overpowering Windu and killing Shock T. Carrying the Chancellor off, he races to a shuttle only to be confronted by Windu, who manages to crush his chest with the Force just before the vessel takes off. Back in space, Anakin and Obi-Wan are working effectively together, and manage, with the aid of a squadron of clone ships, to destroy a Separatist cruiser. Just then, they receive a transmission that General Grievous has captured the Chancellor. Anakin immediately becomes distraught, showing us how much he values his friendship with Palpatine, and the two hurry after Grievous's shuttle, managing to slip inside his flagship's hangar right after the smaller craft containing the droid General and the captive Chancellor. Once on board, the two Jedi fight their way through numerous droids before coming to a larger room, where they find the Chancellor strapped to a chair. As they move to free him, Dooku enters the room, and we get a little back and forth between him and the Jedi before the trio ignite their lightsabers. In the duel that follows, we see that together, Anakin and Obi-Wan are roughly evenly matched with the Sith Lord, but eventually Dooku manages to fling Obi-Wan across the room using the Force, knocking him out. At this, we see Anakin grow angrier, and he rushes at Dooku, slashing with more fury. Dooku seems surprised as Anakin fuels himself with rage, and Palpatine's face takes on the hint of a sinister smile as he watches. Eventually, Anakin manages to sever Dooku's hands, holding both his lightsaber and the Sith's to Dooku's throat. Here, as Dooku kneels before Anakin, Palpatine intervenes. I never doubted your abilities for a moment, Anakin. He then glances briefly at Obi-Wan, who is still unconscious. Now, kill him. As Anakin looks to Palpatine, shock flashes across Dooku's face. We then see him move to speak, but Palpatine's hand shifts subtly, and Dooku's words seem to catch in his throat. Palpatine's expression grows more severe. He's too dangerous to be left alive, Anakin. Think of how much power he has already managed to amass. If we let him stand trial before the Senate, who can know what might happen? Long have his agents worked to undermine our system from within. Anakin replies that he shouldn't do it, that it's not the Jedi way. It is too great a risk, Anakin. We can deal a severe blow to the Separatists, right here, right now. Think of how many people might be saved, for what? The life of one traitor? Anakin severs Dooku's head, and then frees Palpatine from his restraints. When he expresses doubt over the righteousness of his actions, Palpatine lays a hand on his shoulder. Things are not always so clear in times of war, Anakin, but search your heart, and I trust you will find that you have done a noble deed this day. The two then help Obi-Wan recover, and together the three head for the exit. Meanwhile, General Grievous, spotting them on displays from the command bridge, heads off to confront them alongside a number of his Magna Guards. We return to the trio navigating the corridors of his ship, heading for the hangar bay. Turning a corner, they come face to face with the droid general and his retinue. Obi-Wan and Anakin ignite their lightsabers, and begin battling the Magna Guards as Palpatine stays behind them. Just then, the ship shudders from an impact, and Anakin says, I've got an idea. Before Obi-Wan can stop him, he signals for the nearby Republic cruisers to open fire with all batteries on Grievous' flagship, and the vessel begins shaking violently. 
Taking advantage of the distraction, the three hurry to the hangars and board a shuttle as Grievous flees via an escape pod. As our heroes descend towards the surface of Coruscant, Palpatine thanks the two Jedi, focusing his praises on Anakin, and we get another show of the latter's skills as a pilot. In the aftermath of the attack, we get several shots of the people of Coruscant cleaning up and rebuilding following the conclusion of the battle. We then cut to the halls of the Senate building, where Palpatine and Anakin are walking amidst a group of senators. As some of them wonder how the Separatists were able to muster for a strike at the heart of the Republic, the sounds of a commotion break out, and we then see Mace Windu, Sasi Tin, and other Jedi arresting yet another member of the Senate, charging him with being in league with a Sith Lord. The other senators are visibly unsettled as they watch the proceedings, and mutter amongst themselves. Palpatine turns to Anakin, his face suddenly grim. These are dark times indeed. It seems some of the members of your order have grown rather overzealous in protecting their own power. Anakin stares after the retreating Jedi, and then complains that the Council still refuses to make him a master, despite all he has achieved. They fear me. I can see it in the way they look at me. He goes on to say that if he were made a master, he would finally receive full access to the Jedi archives. As they speak, the group approaches Padme, who steps out and smiles. Anakin pauses when he sees her, but a worried look comes across his face. Palpatine, standing at his side, notices this. I am afraid those with power will always guard it jealously against others who might supplant them. Such is the nature of things. I suppose, for all their preaching, in this regard the Jedi are not so different from the rest of us. Padme then approaches the two, and warmly welcomes Anakin back to the capital. Palpatine excuses himself, leaving the pair to wander away from the crowd, where they embrace. Padme then reveals that she is pregnant, and Anakin is overjoyed, but then a shadow passes over his expression. What? Padme asks. Anakin's look grows distant. They won't have to know, she says. We can find somewhere quiet and distant, somewhere no one will know us. At this, Anakin forces a smile, then glances back to the crowd nearby. We shouldn't have to hide like this, treating our love like it's some unnatural thing to be shunned. Anakin, the Jedi code is very clear. If they discovered, they won't, he says. It's just frustrating, is all. Cut to a meeting of the Jedi Council, where Palpatine stands before them alongside Anakin. He remarks on how the relationship between the Council and the Senate has been deteriorating, in part due to their handling of the hunt for the supposed Sith Lord and anyone connected to him. Yoda and Windu respond that their actions have been taken for the good of the Republic, and while Palpatine agrees, he states that it is getting harder and harder to assure the members of the Senate that the Jedi are on their side. I can try to allay their fears, the Chancellor says. But, I would like to make a small request, that if you will not make him a master, you will at least grant young Skywalker a seat on the council. Both the council members and Anakin look surprised at this. I owe him my life, Palpatine explains, and he has more than proved his worth over the course of this war. He bested Count Dooku, and in doing so brought this war ever closer to the conclusion we all hope to see. Yoda and Windu share a suspicious glance then look to the other masters seated around them. With no overt objections, Yoda agrees to their request. Palpatine then departs, and Obi-Wan gives Anakin an encouraging look, though he sees distrust and skepticism in the eyes of the others around him. I fear the Chancellor is involved in all of this, Mace Windu says once the doors have closed. Several of the others nod and share his sentiments. Anakin once more looks surprised. You can't mean that, can you? He asks. The Chancellor's leadership has kept the Republic intact. And amassed power for himself, Yoda responds. The Chancellor trusts you, Mace Windu tells Anakin, and that gives us an advantage. We would like you to keep us informed of his activities. Anakin looks taken aback. You... you want me to spy on him? He asks. To observe, Windu answers, and report anything suspicious back to us. Make no mistake, young Skywalker, these are dangerous times. Anakin grimaces, but ultimately accepts the task. As he departs, Yoda watches him closely. That night, as he lies asleep next to Padme, Anakin tosses and turns, mumbling. 
we see flashes of his nightmare, where he glimpses Padme suffering and calling out for him, as he shouts back for her. Looking around for help, he sees the Jedi watching him with disdain, and one by one they turn their backs and walk away, until only Obi-Wan remains. Then he too abandons Anakin, ignoring his pupil's desperate cries, and distraught, Anakin collapses back to the ground. Here, he senses someone standing over him, and looks up to see himself, gripping a red lightsaber. The other him offers his hand, and Anakin stares at it, then wakes up with a start. Padme, awoken by his cries, asks what's wrong. His breathing slows, and he takes a long, careful look at her, the echoes of his nightmare still faintly audible. Anakin tells her that it was just a dream, and lies back down, but as he does so, his eyes remain open, and the camera focuses on his worried expression. The next day, Obi-Wan stands before the Council, who are discussing their plans to end the war. They hope that with the defeat of General Grievous, the Separatists' will to fight will crumble, and assign the task to Kenobi. Afterwards, they hope that Palpatine will acknowledge the situation and give up his emergency powers. And if he refuses, they intend to arrest him, knowing full well the unrest it might cause in the Senate. Yoda asks Obi-Wan if they can trust Anakin to serve as an informant, and Obi-Wan assures them that they can. Anakin may be rash and overconfident, but he has a good heart, and he is no stranger to adversity. He will do the right thing, I assure you. We now jump to the remote planet of Utapau, where the remaining Separatist leaders have gathered in secret to attempt to formulate plans for continuing the war. General Grievous arrives, and informs the Separatist Council that with the death of Count Dooku, he is now taking it upon himself to direct their war effort. He states that they will be relocated to the remote system of Mustafar for their own safety. Some of the Separatist leaders attempt to challenge his abrupt seizure of power, but Grievous not so subtly threatens them if they refuse to comply. We see some nervous glances pass amongst the members of the Inner Circle, but none of them dare to speak out further. Back on Coruscant, the Jedi Council receive word from the Supreme Chancellor that Republic intelligence has uncovered evidence of Grievous's presence on Utapau. While the Jedi aim to kill Grievous, they hope to capture the Separatist leadership alive in order to uncover the identity of the Sith Lord working from within the Republic. Obi-Wan Kenobi is tasked with scouting out Utapau, while other masters are dispatched to take advantage of the Separatists' disarray with Dooku's death. Yoda, a longtime friend of the Wookiees, decides to venture to Kashyyyk, where the CIS has launched a new offensive, while Mace Windu remains behind to act in his stead in the capital. After we get a brief scene of Anakin and Padme interacting in their shared dwelling place, with Anakin worrying over his wife and her pregnancy, he then meets with Obi-Wan, who informs him of his new assignment. Anakin complains that the Council clearly doesn't think much of himself if they just plan to keep him here instead of sending him with his master, but Obi-Wan disagrees. The Council knows your value, Anakin, and I'm sure they will make you a master soon. You are still young, but you have a bright future ahead of you. I know I haven't always been the best teacher. He turns away. If Qui-Gon were still here. Anakin dismisses his concerns and forces a smile. Good luck, Master, and may the Force be with you. As Obi-Wan departs, Anakin watches him go, and a troubled look returns to his face. We see Obi-Wan preparing for his mission, speaking with a group of clone ARC commandos and Commander Cody, and then cut back to Anakin, who meets with Palpatine in his office in the Senate building. Anakin tries to appear calm and collected, but Palpatine can clearly sense that something is amiss. Eventually, he asks what is wrong. As the camera focuses on Anakin's face, we see brief flashes of his nightmares, of Padme suffering and him yelling for her, of the Jedi turning away from him, and then of the shadowy version of himself clutching a red lightsaber. Anakin looks up at Palpatine. I'm just... afraid. There's someone I care about, and I worry that I won't be able to protect them. Palpatine watches him knowingly, then invites Anakin to sit beside him. Have you expressed these fears to the Council? The Chancellor asks. No, no. They wouldn't understand. Jedi, we aren't supposed to have such attachments. They teach that attachment leads to fear, and that fear is the path to the dark side. And do you believe that? Anakin looks back at him, hesitant. I... 
I don't know. Yes, well, the Jedi Code doesn't leave much room for debate or dissent, now does it? Palpatine asks rhetorically. They tell you that this leads to the dark side, but what do you know of it? Anakin's face grows more serious, and he studies Palpatine's expression for a moment. The dark side of the Force? In all honesty, I don't know very much. They teach us that the Sith use it, that they give into it, draw their power from it. That much is true, Palpatine replies, but it does not belong to the Sith alone. Such labels only exist because the Jedi, or others like them, have created them. Even Master Windu of your order utilizes emotion in combat in a way many might consider far from the light. Have you ever witnessed it? Anakin nods. Truly spectacular, I must say. Palpatine then explains that he himself was quite fascinated with the Force in his youth growing up on Naboo. I dreamt of changing the galaxy and sought the means to do so wherever they might be found. For in order to help people, we must probe the depths of knowledge and uncover secrets regardless of where they lie buried. I see no reason that a skilled and capable Jedi such as yourself should not be permitted to study such fields, especially when they might unlock powers currently only dreamt of. The Jedi preach control, Anakin tells him, that by surrendering attachment and ridding ourselves of emotion, we avoid becoming corrupted by the world, in the way the Sith do. But you have your doubts, Palpatine half asks, half observes. I... I just don't understand why we can't embrace what we are instead of hiding and suppressing it. Palpatine nods. The Jedi hinder themselves with their rigidity. They are the guardians of peace and justice in the galaxy, and yet they strive to live above the rest of us. In doing so, they forsake things no living being should be deprived of. Attachment and passion, anger, grief, even love. He looks more closely at Anakin. These things are a part of us, of all of us. To deny that is, well, a fruitless endeavor. In the end, it only leads to more suffering. And there is enough of that in the galaxy as it is. Wouldn't you agree, Anakin? Anakin remains silent for several seconds, thinking on what has been said, as we see flashes of various scenes, of his mother dying, of him slaughtering the sand people, of Dooku severing his hand, and of him embracing Padme. Then, he hesitantly asks, What do you know of the Sith? Of the Sith? Well, I could tell you, in an academic sense, of their rise and fall, of how supposedly some now lurk in the shadows, advancing some nefarious agenda, but who can truly say how much of it is fact, and how much myth, or even lie? The Jedi eradicated the Sith thousands of years ago, and as all who work in politics well know, history is written by those who triumph. Perhaps the Sith really were a vile threat a sinister cabal who sought domination over all the galaxy. Or perhaps the Jedi and the Sith are merely two different ways of viewing the world, neither truly good nor evil. He slowly looks to Anakin, and the camera rests on the troubled Jedi as he ponders the Chancellor's words. We now cut to Utapau, where Obi-Wan's ship descends to the planet's surface. From hidden vantage points, a number of droids watch as he lands, where he is greeted by a local. The official covertly warns him off, and Obi-Wan feigns nonchalance, departing amicably. Heading back up into the sky, he sends a transmission to the Republic fleet waiting nearby, then circles back around to land at a different site on the planet. Meanwhile, Grievous passes through a control room and slams the door, then comes to stand before a hologram of Lord Sidious. He asks his master what their next move should be, stating that the Republic could discover them here at any moment but Sidious informs him to remain present for the time being. Grievous angrily ends the connection, then storms out of the room. Cut to Kashyyyk, where Yoda arrives ahead of a Separatist assault on the planet. He oversees the Wookiees preparing their defenses, as Commander Gree, leader of the clone forces on the planet, stands watchful nearby. Back on Coruscant, Anakin returns to his apartment with Padme. He tells her that he wishes they could declare their love publicly, but she once more warns him against it, instead hoping to find somewhere nice and quiet to settle down and raise their family. But Anakin resents that he cannot have both that life and this one. 
Padme thinks that it would be best to leave the world of the Senate and the Jedi Council behind, and confides in Anakin that she worries about the direction the Republic is taking, with how much power the Chancellor has amassed. But Anakin defends Palpatine, arguing that the Republic would have long ago crumbled were it not for his strong leadership. We end with a shot of the two of them sitting side by side, holding hands as each looks away from the other worriedly. Back on Utapau, Obi-Wan and a team of elite ARC commandos sneak into the Separatist-controlled territory, finding Grievous directing his droid subordinates. Obi-Wan signals to Commander Cody, leading the main assault force, and the battle for Utapau begins. As the clone forces descend upon the city, Obi-Wan and the commandos attack Grievous in the confusion, and the droid general resorts to using his four-armed form. Though after the wounds sustained from Mace Windu, he is no longer nearly as formidable as he used to be. With the battle in full swing, we cut briefly to the conflict on Kashyyyk before returning to Coruscant. Here, Anakin meets with Palpatine in a grand auditorium, and after exchanging pleasantries, Palpatine consents what is on the Jedi's mind. He instructs the others to leave him, and then tells Anakin that they can now speak freely. When Anakin still remains reluctant, Palpatine coaxes him. To tell you the truth, Anakin, I have come to share many of your doubts in the Jedi. I fear that their desire to protect the Republic has corrupted them, that they have grown to seek power for themselves against any and all who might challenge them, including the Senate and myself as an extension. Anakin shies away, then turns back to face him. They have asked me to spy on you, he admits guiltily. I figured as much, Palpatine responds. I suspect they intend to supplant me, and the rest of the Senate as well, once this war is concluded. He looks at Anakin, but doesn't press him on this accusation. It's a shame, really. The Order has fallen so far from the heights upon which it once stood. Of course, there is still strength of character to be found among their number. Your Master Obi-Wan has a good heart, and you yourself are quite capable. But you are different from the rest of them, Anakin. They know it as much as I do, and I suspect you do as well. Why do you think they fear you? He asks the young Jedi. Because they know you will surpass them, and they are frightened by that which they cannot control. Here, he relates the story of Darth Plagueis the Wise, the Dark Lord of the Sith who supposedly discovered power over life itself, only to be supplanted by his apprentice, who killed him after being taught everything he knew. As he concludes the tale, we can see Anakin's desire for such power showing plainly on his face. We then cut briefly to Kashyyyk, where the battle for the Wookiee's homeland still rages, before returning to Utapau. As the clones overwhelm the defending droids, Obi-Wan and the remaining commandos give chase to Grievous when the latter attempts to flee. Eventually, Obi-Wan manages to kill Grievous with a blaster he force pulls to himself, and as the droid general collapses to the ground, the Jedi discards the blaster in disgust. So uncivilized. Back on Coruscant, Anakin sits alone, contemplating Palpatine's words. He sees flashes of Padme suffering, and the Jedi refusing to aid him, and then the Chancellor, musing on the supposed power of the dark side to stop people from dying. Rising, he goes to Palpatine's office, where he confronts him on his true nature. You spoke of the dark side of the Force. How is it that you came to know of it? My own mentor taught me, Palpatine responds. In the days of my youth, he encouraged me to take a broader view in lieu of the narrow lens held by the Jedi. In order to understand the great mysteries of the galaxy, you must come to understand all its aspects. Anything less is doing a disservice to yourself. Anakin stops pacing and glares at him. It's you. You are the Sith Lord. Palpatine remains stoic. Even if I was, would that not give proof to the lies of the Jedi? All my life has been devoted to preserving the Republic, to weathering the countless storms that the weakness of the Jedi has enabled. He pauses, then draws closer to the young Jedi. Anakin, I am still the man you've known all these years, the man who has given you counsel, who has seen your potential when others sought to hinder your abilities. Nothing has changed. Have I not been a friend to you? At this, Anakin ignites his lightsaber, but Palpatine goes on. I have only ever told you the truth, Anakin. The Jedi have had years to cloud your mind 
to poison you against all other paths, but I know you possess the strength to forge your own. Search your heart, search the feelings the Jedi demand you abandon, and see the truth. Let it make you strong. Anakin's hand trembles, and he continues to glare at the Chancellor. I beg you, Anakin, for your sake and mine, see through the lies of the Jedi. Cast off the shackles you have allowed them to bind you with. Refuse to be a pawn of the council that fears and resents you any longer. Become the hero you were meant to be. The hero the galaxy needs. And together, we can ensure that the people of the galaxy know peace and prosperity. And we can save the one you love. At this, Anakin's expression changes. He steps closer, then deactivates his saber. I'm going to inform the council, he states curtly. Do what you must, Palpatine says. But remember, the fate of the galaxy, and of your wife, now lie in your hands. Cut to Mace Windu, speaking with a group of clones and officers, who inform him that General Grievous has just been killed. A grim look comes over his face, and he turns to see Anakin hurrying towards him. Anakin pulls the Master aside, and tells him that he believes Chancellor Palpatine is the Sith Lord. Windu expresses shock, but states that they need to act carefully, and tells a reluctant Anakin that he needs to remain behind. He then gathers several other Jedi Masters, along with a number of government officials, officers, and Senate guards. With the defeat of General Grievous, he announces, the Supreme Chancellor no longer has any reason to retain his emergency powers. He then leads the gathering to the Chancellor's office, where Palpatine waits to greet them. Master Windu, you're here sooner than I expected. The Chancellor takes a moment to glance at the officials and soldiers gathered around him. Windu orders him to resign his position, by order of the Galactic Senate, to which Palpatine responds, I am the Senate. Windu and the Jedi step forward, reaching for their lightsabers. If you do not relinquish power voluntarily, you will be removed by force, Chancellor. At this, Palpatine's countenance falls. It's treason, then. As he says this, the officials and Senate Guard depart the room, leaving the surprised Jedi alone with the Chancellor, who deftly retrieves a lightsaber of his own and launches himself at the fore. He strikes down Aegon Kolar, Sasi Tin, and Kit Fisto with lightning speed, and Mace Windu, the only survivor, is barely able to block his blows in time. The two then begin fighting, as we see Mace drawing on his own rage to muster the strength to withstand the Sith Lord. Cut back to Anakin, who is nervously pacing about in another section of the building, as we see flashes of Padme suffering, and of Palpatine offering his help. Making up his mind, he hurries towards the Chancellor's office as we cut back to the fight. Here, Windu manages to disarm Palpatine, and corners him, lunging for a killing blow just as Anakin enters. Palpatine implores Anakin to save him, stating that it is just as he feared, the Jedi seek to overthrow the Senate and rule the galaxy themselves. Anakin, seeing flashes of Padme, looks to Palpatine, and then urges Mace Windu to spare him, saying that he must stand trial. Windu retorts that it's far too dangerous to leave him alive, given his control over the Senate, and lunges at Palpatine, only for Anakin to sever his hand. Palpatine then unleashes Force Lightning on the wounded master, who is thrown to his death. As a distraught Anakin reels with what he has just done, Palpatine rises to his feet, and states that through his actions, Anakin has saved the Republic. Once more the Sith shall rule the galaxy, and we shall have peace. But we must act quickly. Join me, become my apprentice, and together we can save Padme. Anakin accepts, and Palpatine bids him to rise, as Darth Vader. Go to the Jedi Temple, Sidious tells his new apprentice, and eliminate any opposition to our rule. Cut to Anakin and the 501st marching on the Jedi Temple, as back in his office, Palpatine initiates Order 66, the covert purge of all Jedi by the clones. We cut to various scenes across the galaxy, where clone troopers turn on their Jedi commanders. In some instances, where non-clone Republic forces are present, 
we see their confusion, and some even get caught up in the crossfire when attempting to aid their Jedi allies. We see several masters killed, including Ki Adi Mundi, Plo Koon, and Aayla Secura, and Obi Wan is fired upon on Utapau, plunging into the waters below. Back in the Jedi Temple, we see the various Jedi present desperately defending themselves, and Anakin cuts down several knights in silence, his face anguished. When he comes to a room where a number of younglings are hiding, he puts away his lightsaber and kneels before them, and the camera zooms in on his face. Don't worry, you're safe now. Padme watches distraught from her apartment as the Jedi Temple burns in the distance, while Senator Bail Organa tries approaching the building, only to be turned away by the 501st. When he asks what's going on, they inform him that the Jedi have attempted a coup against the Chancellor. Back in the Senate building, Mon Mothma and a number of senators are meeting when clones storm the building, informing them as well, and stating that the Chancellor has dispatched them to provide security. Cut to Kashyyyk, where throughout all of this, Yoda has sensed the deaths of the Jedi. He manages to escape their fate, and makes his way to a ship as the battle continues nearby. On Utapau, Obi-Wan likewise manages to survive, and finds the Jedi Temple broadcasting a nondescript message summoning all members of the Order back to Coruscant. Back in the capital, Anakin is reunited with a frightened and confused Padme. She tells him, They're saying the Jedi tried to rebel against the Senate, but that can't be true, can it? He assures his wife that the two of them will be safe, and that they won't have to worry about hiding their love any longer. I just have one final mission to complete before peace will be restored to the galaxy, he tells her. Taking the necklace his mother gave him, he presses it into his wife's hand and embraces her. I will be back. Obi-Wan and Yoda manage to sneak into the Jedi Temple, finding clone troopers waiting in ambush. After cutting through them, the two deactivate the beacon in order to prevent others from falling for the trap, and then go to review the security footage, where they see Anakin leading the clones, striking down several Jedi Knights. Obi-Wan is horrified, but Yoda looks on stoically. The Grand Master says that Kenobi must confront his former Padawan, while he will challenge the Chancellor in a last-ditch effort to prevent his takeover. Obi-Wan begs Yoda for them to swap tasks, saying that he is not sure he could fight his former pupil, but Yoda convinces him that it must be this way. Obi-Wan heads to Padme's apartment, where she is surprised to see him. I knew it couldn't be true, she says, about the Jedi. He asks what she means, and she tells him about the rumor that the Jedi Order tried to overthrow the Chancellor. Palpatine has called an emergency session of the Senate, and she is just about to attend. Here, Obi-Wan gives her the news about Anakin, that he has turned to the dark side and betrayed the Order. She refuses to believe at first, but he shows her the footage of Anakin killing Jedi in the temple, and she breaks down. This can't be true. There has to be some kind of mistake. Obi-Wan just watches her solemnly. I need to know where Anakin went. Padme slowly looks up at him. You're going to kill him, aren't you? I'm going to confront him. Perhaps it's not too late. Perhaps I can still help him. Padme, please, for the sake of your child. She looks up, and we cut to the fiery planet of Mustafar. Anakin's ship descends to a landing pad, and he strides into the main structure, where he is met by the remaining members of the Separatist Council. Lord Sidious told us you would be coming, Newt Gunray says. The camera lingers on Anakin's face. He glares, and we cut to the Senate chamber. Mon Mothma, Bail Organa, and other like-minded senators listen as Palpatine addresses the body. In light of this recent attack on our venerable institutions, the remaining Jedi will be hunted down and defeated. As his speech continues, we cut back and forth between the Senate, where many of the members applaud his words, and Mustafar, where Anakin ignites his lightsaber and begins slaughtering the Separatist Council. It is unfortunate that this nefarious coup was attempted just as the Separatists stood on the verge of defeat, but have no doubt, I will see peace and stability restored to the galaxy. In order to achieve these ends, I will be retaining emergency powers for the foreseeable future during these trying times. 
Anakin strikes down the final member of the Separatist Council. While back on Coruscant, the majority of the Senate applauds uproariously, as Senators Mothma and Organa exchange frightened glances. On Mustafar, we see a new ship land alongside Anakin's, and he rushes out to meet it. Padme descends from the ramp, and Anakin hurries to embrace her, then notices her look of hesitation. What is it? he asks. Obi-Wan told me. He told me that you betrayed the Republic, that you killed Jedi. No, Padme, don't you see? The Jedi betrayed us. They never would have let us be together. They fear me. They were holding me back. Padme gets choked up, and when Anakin steps towards her, she backs away. You can't listen to them, he begs her. They lie to maintain power. They will destroy anyone who challenges them. Open your eyes as I did. Anakin, you've turned against everything we ever stood for. She produces his mother's necklace, clutching it tightly. Think of what your mother would... Anakin's fist curls into a ball, and Padme begins to choke. We then hear Obi-Wan's voice. Let her go, Anakin. He shifts his gaze and spots his former master emerging from the ship. You! You turned her against me! You have done that yourself. Anakin's gaze goes back to Padme, and his face fills with rage. You brought him here to kill me. No, I love you. I... Anakin begins to choke her once more, and Padme collapses to the ground. The camera cuts to her hand, from which Anakin's mother's necklace falls out. Let her go, Obi-Wan shouts, rushing forward. Anakin releases his grip and shifts to face his former master and the two stare each other down. It doesn't have to end like this, Anakin tells him. Join us. Help us bring peace and security to the galaxy. There is no peace or security to be found under the rule of the Sith, Anakin. See through the lies of the Jedi. Don't let them hold you back. Cast off your fear of the dark side like I have. Your lust for power is already consuming you. I am sorry, Anakin. I have failed you. No. You helped me to see. Anakin ignites his lightsaber, and Obi-Wan does likewise. The two then launch at each other, their weapons clashing. Cut back to Coruscant, where Palpatine returns to his office after his speech, only to find Yoda waiting there. Master Yoda, he says calmly. What a surprise. Yoda addresses him as Darth Sidious, and then, for the first time in this trilogy, ignites his own lightsaber. The two begin to battle, with the platform rising into the now emptied Senate chamber. Palpatine forces Yoda back with lightning, and we can see the Jedi Master's strength waning as he struggles to resist the Sith Lord's power. Cut back to Mustafar, where Anakin and Obi-Wan continue their duel. They make their way through the facility, and end up slashing much of the equipment in a control room, causing the lava levels to rise outside. Now back to Coruscant, where Palpatine once more attempts to overwhelm Yoda with Force Lightning. The latter struggles to deflect it with his lightsaber, and is then flung back, falling gravely injured to the floor of the chamber, and losing his own lightsaber in the process. As the deployment of Coruscant Guard clone troopers enter and begin to search for him, Yoda manages to evade them and escapes via a maintenance shaft. Back on Mustafar, Obi-Wan and Anakin's duel has taken them outside, to a series of platforms over the lava. Molten spray fills the air, and the two lock lightsabers, Anakin's eyes filled with fury. All around them the lava continues to rise, and the machinery begins to melt. Seeing this, Obi-Wan attempts to jump to safety, but Anakin is too blinded by rage to notice the danger he is in. Obi-Wan pushes his former pupil back with the Force and then leaps to solid ground leaving Anakin behind. When Anakin jumps after him, Obi-Wan cuts him down, leaving Anakin to roll onto the fiery rocks as Obi-Wan, now separated from him by the rising channels of lava, delivers his dramatic monologue. Anakin watches with rage blazing in his eyes, his face contorting in anguish, as his master departs. As Obi-Wan brings an unconscious Padme aboard their ship and takes off, we see a group of clones arriving at the facility, who rush to find Anakin, immolated and yet still clinging to life. Recovering him, they bring him back to Coruscant, where Palpatine comes to his side. 
We then cut to a small vessel in orbit over Coruscant. Bail Organa, Mon Mothma, and a number of like-minded senators discuss plans for how to resist the Chancellor's growing power, while Yoda announces that he will go into exile. Obi-Wan then arrives, and Padme is rushed to the Med Bay, where she gives birth to twins, whom she names Luke and Leia. Their mother, barely conscious, smiles at the two infants, but as Obi-Wan looks on, worried, the medical droid informs him that Padme's vitals appear to be fading, even as they cannot determine the cause. Here, we cut back to Palpatine, who grins slightly, watching as the mutilated Anakin is fitted with the familiar suit of Darth Vader. We see through Anakin's eyes as the mask is lowered onto his face, and as the screen goes black, we hear his iconic breathing. The camera then cuts to Palpatine, standing nearby. Rise, Lord Vader. Finally, as Bail Organa reunites with his wife on Alderaan, holding an infant Leia, Obi-Wan approaches Owen and Beru on Tatooine, introducing them to Luke. Accepting their nephew, the pair stand before a binary sunset as Obi-Wan looks on, and the credits roll. And there you have it, an outline for my rewrite of the Star Wars prequel trilogy. I'm sure both fans and detractors of the existing prequels will have a lot to say about it, so let me know what parts you liked and which parts you didn't in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. And if you would like to see more content from me in the future, I would greatly appreciate it if you supported me on my Patreon, which is linked in the description. Every little bit helps. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.
めないで消さないで負けないで誰だってもてるはず譲れないもの愛だけ夢だけ君だけそれだけは離さないどんなとんでも This is Tim Schenectady, Pitchfork News, and you are now listening to. Sir, a transmission from the planet. What's in your wallet? Are you going to f me? I would certainly like to. Is that legal? I know. Watching this sick shit. This is sickening.